So you come back, you're getting ready for Somalia. Somalia kicks off. Can you kind of walk us through what that was like? Yeah. It's the hardest shit ever. Did. You know, when you watch the movie after being there, you're like, oh, it's kind of funny. I didn't see half that shit. And I know those people. So it's not a movie to me. It's a reenactment. I just, I just kind of break down and can't do it. Right on infill, getting shot at. RPGs through the helicopter. So we had to take a house down under fire and fight our way in. Grabbed all the detainees, getting ready to exfil them, and then the five-ton gets hit with an RPG and blows up. And then a ranger sitting next to a gate, just taking a break, his neck explodes. I'm like, fuck, this is growing. And then I hear an RPG and I look up and I see the helicopter spinning out of control off to the west and fighting our way down the street, you know, to the crash site. And then just spent 18 hours there that whole night was just uh i don't know even how to explain it to people who won't just if it's wasted on people who don't have a clue welcome to mic drop the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent 25 years on active duty, 20 of which was with Delta Force, including being the Command Sergeant Major of D Squadron. Received a Silver Star and five Bronze Stars. He's the author of two books, one All Secure and the other is Arsenal of Hope. Both you got to go check out or choke yourself. He's the co-CEO of the All Secure Foundation, which assists special operations and active duty combat vets and their families in recovery of post-traumatic stress therapy, education, awareness, resources for healing, marriage retreats, and PTS resiliency training. Ladies and gentlemen, if Kenny Rogers joined Delta Force, welcome to the stage, Tom Satterley. Oh, man, Kenny Rogers. That's a good one. (laughs) I mean, there's there's a resemblance for sure in a good way. I mean, Kenny Rogers is a stud, so you can't can't be mad at that. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time to come here. I know uh, you guys are busy, and uh, you and your lovely wife made made the trip down here to be on the show. And uh, especially this time of year, Texas is kind of the the devil's armpit weather wise. So uh, I appreciate you taking the time to come down here and, and tell us your story and talk about your amazing foundation. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. agree with you about the weather, man. Yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> what's yeah, going on? Yeah, it's brutal. Um, what uh, What's the last full book that you read? Hmm. And finished. My wife's. Yeah, I was going to say, I can't take credit for Arsenal of Hope. That's Jen's book. Um, you guys are a, t- a tag team, though. No, so seriously. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, they're both about me, about how shitty I am. But um, <laughs> her book's the last book I read yeah. all the way through several times. Um, not just to help her, but every time I read it, I'm like, wow. Yeah. I learned something new that, that she tells me every day that I don't listen to. Yeah. And then I read the book. I'm like, oh, that, yeah, I get it now. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, that was a book for me of eye opening, even though you help her write it. You, she knows the stories. She lives yeah. with you, and, and, and some of it's pretty shitty. Um, yeah. You can learn a lot from that. Yeah, well, I can imagine. I mean, it's uh, was there any uh, kind of come-to-Jesus moments for you? Mm, how many? <laughs> how much time do you I, got? I have come-to-Jesus moments every day, yeah. um, more so in the past when I just kept screwing up, and I'd learn a lot more. So I'm, I'm learning a little bit less because I've learned it all now. Uh, when to shut up. Yeah. When to self-assess and just remain quiet versus outbursts, yeah, <laughs> things yeah. like that. So, yeah, yeah, those come to Jesus moments of uh, the eye-opening things that, that Jen would tell me in a calm manner, and I'm freaking out like, "What do you mean?" Blah, blah, blah. She's like, "There's really no reason to be that way," and I'm like, yeah. "There's a lot of reasons to be that way." She's like, "Yeah, there were." So those come to Jesus moments were like just awareness, self-awareness yeah. of what I'm doing. Sure, yeah, that's powerful, no doubt. Um, do you have a favorite childhood memory? Hmm. Yeah, uh, camping with my father um, the night before we floated down the river in Indiana, just me and him uh, setting up a tent in a little park somewhere behind some truck stop in Indiana, you know, in a, in a park, and then preparing to hit the, the river the next morning to float down all day back to where we lived and and just uh, camping out with him. And then like a group of guys drove by in their big trucks and shit, you know, and you fuck with people, right? You know, and here we are in the tent. Somebody screaming, oh, a couple homos in the tent. I'm like terrified now. I'm like, oh, it's my dad, man. I'm not, you know. And yeah. He's like, I got this. And, he, you know, he was just so cool and calm. Um, didn't really freak out about anything. And yeah. so that was one of my memories that always comes back to, that just that float trip with him on that yeah. boat down the river. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, what is your morning routine on a normal, normal day that you're in town and uh, there's not something out of the ordinary going on? 
Wow. Lately, it's hot tub and cold plunge. I've been trying to dive into that. Finally bought a cold plunge. And Which one a, did you get? Oh, shit. I just bought a little uh, Is it the tub? expandable. Yeah. Not the tub. Those are way too expensive yeah. for me right now. And I didn't know if I would like it yet. So yeah. jumping from the hot tub to the kiddie pool, and it's cold enough. I'm like, okay, this is a start. You know, and yeah. Jen's been doing it with me. And then bought the cold plunge. I just bought a chiller that just arrived at home. So now I can keep it cold without pumping ice into it all yeah. the time. So that was... Uh, that's becoming the morning ritual. Before it was lay in bed and complain. Yeah. Mentally complain to myself about how shitty life is, you know? Yeah. And shook it up in a good mood and, uh, and, the and, end and just start ending. smiling. And I'm like, fuck you. What the <laughs> fuck, you know? And fuck, fuck, fuck. And then my day's shitty, you know? So now I get up, I get moving, I get in the hot tub, you know, just a lot of stiff bone shit, you know? Yeah. And then get in the cold plunge and then you have the energy. Mm-hmm. And I remember from the past, you know, oh, all the rehab out in Arizona where you got in the cold plunge, you felt better. Yeah. So that's kind of the new morning norm. Now. Do you uh, do you time it where you spend a, a specific amount of time in each? No, I'm Just not. I'm not that cool, man. I yeah. get in, and when I'm freaked out or I, or I run out of time or I feel like I got to go somewhere, I get out. You yeah. Know? Or yeah. it's one of those. How long can I do this? You yeah. Know? Can yeah. I do it for thirty minutes? I don't know. Is that normal? Should I? I, I never know. Yeah. I just get in it till it sucks, and I'm like, okay, that must be the best time to get out. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get out. All right. Hey guys, I want to take a, a second to talk about ads. Um, and this is not an ad. This is me talking about the ads. I know that, um, you know, sometimes we get comments of, of people bitching about the ads. There's too many ads or they're too long or what have you. And I, I want to clear two things up, which is number one is that my slash our team's ability to bring you guests and, and bring them in and, and the accommodations and, and the entire process that it takes to produce these shows to the level with which we do uh, requires funding, you know, and the, the sponsors give us an ability to bring these shows to you. So while I understand that everybody wants zero ads and, and everything bunched together and, and what have you, this is how we, we bring this show to you. Uh, you know, we're a very small team. We're very fortunate to, to be able to do it, uh, but we do still have to, uh, to pay bills and, and bring that to you. So keep that in mind. That's the first point. And the second point is that I can assure you with 100% accuracy is that there is not a sponsor or a product that I talk about on here that isn't something that I use. Okay. That, that I either regularly use or always use or have used. And, and I refuse to budge on that. Okay. So we, we get uh, offers for, for sponsors regularly that, that get turned down because it's not stuff that I use or would use. So Keep that in mind, uh, have a little bit of flexibility in terms of our ads and, and realize that they're products that I believe in, that I stand behind, and they're what, what make this show possible. So if you support these advertisers, these sponsors, that is supporting the show. Thank you. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. All right, so you grew up in Indiana. Uh, could you kind of synopsize your childhood and uh, and just what that was like? Siblings, sports, any any significant events growing up? Yeah, I had a brother and a sister. Sister was the oldest, two years apart. So my sister's, you know, probably sixty. You know, my brother's fifty eight. I'm fifty six ish. So that was normal for me growing up. Um, picked on a lot. I grew up in small town Indiana. Man, I had no aspirations. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't have any plans. Um, it's kind of a Indiana kind of cornfield redneck, you know, life of growing up. But I, I grew up as a mischievous kind of kid, you know. Um, we had a golf course. We lived up on three different lakes. I lived on like the smallest lake, and then there's you could cross the dam to the next lake, and then cross the dam to the next lake. So nobody could get to you unless they went all the way around the cornfields into your neighborhood. But you could walk across and would go and throw corn at cars and stuff from the golf course or take those little golf course cups that are cones and line them along the road in a straight line. They look like spikes and the cars would squeal their tires <laughs> at night. And then you'd throw sand at them and take off running. I mean, that was kind of like just the daring yeah. things that we would do and then camp yeah. out in the lot next to our house and never go home in the summer. So it was just yeah. one of those freedom things that, you know, John Cougar moment. Yeah. No, I mean, it, <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, it sounds like it. I mean, growing up in Iowa, it, it wasn't too dissimilar from that. Um, did you play any sports growing up? Yeah, you know, I wasn't great at sports, but 
I tried basketball. It's one of those things like seventh, eighth grade, and I'd bounce the ball, and then I'd kick it. You know, I'd st- I was good at defense. I was fast, and I was you know a little hundred and fifty pound wiry guy. And I could I could steal the ball all the time, but man, if I dribbled it down, yeah. and still body ended up kicking it, and it'd go flying, or I'd miss yeah. the layup. I'm like, I hate sports, man. But then I I took on running, and they kept me putting putting me in uh, like the speed events, the one ten high hurdles. Mm. the 330 low hurdles you know i'm like what is that you know and they're like no you're really good but then they saw me doing that and realized you're a long distance guy so i started cross country and stuff like that so really did you uh do the the mile or longer distance or i would do the mile the two mile and then moved into cross country yeah and so i would do the mile the two mile and then the 110 high hurdles yeah and then i actually made it to regionals one time and i was literally the only white guy there Everybody was six, seven feet tall, stepping over these hurdles. And I literally had to jump each yeah. hurdle and, and knock them over. And these guys are knocking every one of them over. I'm like, up and over like a deer, each one of them. Yeah. You know? and I, I didn't do too well at regionals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I made it to regionals. Yeah. You know, so. yeah. Uh, cross country wise, any, any success uh, competition wise? <sighs> no. No. I mean, I was always winning certain things but for the school, but I didn't go anywhere with that. It was one of those, you know, I'll just run and run and run. And, yeah. And, but it wasn't like an aspiration to to yeah. to kill it and win yeah. everything. Yeah. Any uh, any significant um, uh, events or moments growing up that that impacted your life in a in a heavy or large way? You know, I go back and I, I think of my sister getting hit by a car in front of me. I, it's just one of those things that I don't forget. You know, playing playing with her across the street, throwing the ball across the street like idiots. And then I threw it out and went out in the middle. She ran out to get it right as a car came. Just hit her, rolled up on, I mean, I can see her rolling up on the hood, rolling up on the screen, and then the lady stops, and then she goes flying the other way and hits the ground, and you hear her head hitting the floor. Yeah. It was one of those, I don't know what to do. You know, I just try and run inside the house screaming, she'll get by a car, you know, and they all went running out and took care of her and ran her to the hospital and stuff. But that sticks in my mind. That and the time I cut my knee with a chainsaw. I was trying to cut a tree down, you know. Yeah. And my dad's like, don't fuck with the chainsaw. Like, <laughs> of I, course I, I got this, man. I got this. My mom's out on the lake on a float on her day off, and I crank it up, and I'm cutting the tree down. I get stuck, so i am got my foot up pushing it, pushing it. It finally goes, and when the tree went, the chainsaw dropped it with my hand. Yeah. As it was shutting off, it was like, and then hit my knee, and I was like, all right, we're done. Yeah. Fuck. And then I looked down and saw my knee. It was missing a big old three-inch gash of Jesus. meat up right on, on top yeah. of my knee, so I had to walk out to the dock. Get in the rowboat and roll out there. Hey, mom, grab the boat. She's like, "What's wrong? I'm on my day off. Remember, just grab the boat, man. Just grab the boat. I'm gonna pull you and show you something because I yeah. want to freak out in the, in the lake." Pull to the dock. I go, "Hey, I think I cut my knee." And she looks. She's like, "Oh, dear God!" You know. So yeah. we had to rush to the hospital. Man, but any uh, permanent damage or was it? No, 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 not really. It was yeah. just. Uh, it was one of those cool moments where I got to see somebody stitch me up for the first time. Yeah, you know, and it was kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. I don't know if that's weird, but it was interesting <laughs> when I saw it. No, I mean, I think. Uh, well, I think there's a natural curiosity for it, but uh, you know, most people probably wouldn't want to watch it. But uh, maybe that that was indicative of where you, where you ended up going uh, yeah. afterwards. I got to see stuff, man. Like, what are you doing, and how yeah. are you doing that? And that's cool, and that's weird, but that's cool, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, what What was kind of the the light switch moment for you, or the, the catalyst that made you decide you wanted to join the military? <laughs> or was there? One? You know, the slow drip. I had a I had a real good friend in high school. And we hung out all the time. And, and when we graduated, he joined the Army. I was like, oh, you're an idiot, right? I was building <laughs> houses. And that's all I was doing was building houses. I had no plan, you know. I went to Indiana University for a little bit, blowing my parents' cash, you know, and building houses. And uh, he came back from basic training in the summer of 85. And uh, he was his hair was shaved. He's he was heading off to Germany for two years, and, I'm, and he was telling me all about it. You know, it's not that bad, and we were on our way to a John Cougar concert up in Indianapolis. He's telling me all about it, and by the time we got to Indianapolis, I was like, oh, man. that's the oh, man. shit. That's what I'm doing. I'm just going to yeah. join the Army, get some money, get out, and then pay for college and fin- figure out what I'm going to do later. And I, and I did. I signed up that night, went home and told my parents who freaked out. You know, like, what do you, what do, you do? I'm like, don't worry about it, yeah. man. I'm, I'm out of here. And uh, that February, so that was the end of summer. That February of 86, I went to Fort Leonard Wood and uh, never looked back, really, and never stopped, never thought about getting out after that. What, did you kind of come to that conclusion early on that, like, I'm staying in this for the long haul, or, or was it just kind of each enlistment is like, ah, oh, fuck, I guess I'll stay for another pull? Or The first re-enlistment, um, I'd come in for four years. I was in Germany for three because I ended up getting married. So they're like, now you're stuck here for three years because you're a company. I'm like, oh, fuck, okay. 
And my friend that I was with over there in Germany, he only had two years, and he was leaving on his second year and going back home. And I had one, one year remaining, and he showed me a picture of his dad holding him as a baby wearing his green beret. He's like, this is what I'm going to go do. And I looked at that, and I just stole it. I literally <laughs> stole it right there. I went, I'm fucking doing that too, yeah. man. What were you, you know, doing prior to that? I was a combat engineer in a mechanized unit in Germany. Yeah. Uh, motor pool Mondays where you don't do shit. You know, you work on the heater in your APC, and it, it works all summer long, and then in the winter it breaks. You know, yeah. and you're like, fuck, I hate the regular <laughs> army, man. I hate it so much. They give you zero money and expect everything out of it, you know, and they don't care what you do anyway. And, and a year later, you know, I tried to get in, in SF, and uh, they, they were like, well, you made E5 too quick. You need PLDC. You can't get in to SF without PLDC. And they wouldn't send me to PLDC in Germany because I was already E5. I'm like, well, shit, I'll just re-enlist for airborne school, you know, and I'll get to Fort Bragg somehow. So I did that and got to Fort Bragg and then found the recruiters and then went out for SF. And then a year and a half later after SF is done and S SFAS and then SF and then language school, I'd already changed my mind, you know, like I got approached by some guys that were in the Q course with me. And they showed up at language school uh, during a break. And like, hey, man, we think you have what it takes. You should try the unit. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> shit, yeah, I'll try that. Sounds better than this. Did you know what it was prior to that? You know, I was introduced to it in Germany as an E4. And they're like, you can't come in. This is for E5s and above. And I'm, I'm like, no, I snuck in, man, you know. And uh, <laughs> it's a movie theater. Nobody gives a shit. And I snuck in. And this guy in this bad suit is down there by himself with this little uh, turntable of pictures that pop up, whatever that, remember that, whatever that slide deck thing was. Yeah. I don't, kids don't know what that is anymore. But he popped up one of them, and it was just a, a shitty picture of the planet Earth. And he goes, this is our training area. And I thought, fuck yeah. <laughs> that doesn't even make sense, but <laughs> fuck Yeah. <laughs> You know, and then people were asking questions like, hey, what do you want? You know, do you get more money, you know, when you're in the unit? And he goes, if you want more money, I don't want you. Next. Yeah. yeah. Do you get to grow your hair long? If you want long hair, I don't give a fuck. Get out. You know, he goes, matter of fact, I don't even want to be here. Yeah. They make us come here and I don't want to be here. I don't want any of you unless you want nothing but to come do this kind of shit. And I just sat there like, wow, I want that. I don't even know what it is and I want that. Never heard about it since then until language school. And those guys like, hey. You ever heard of this? I'm like, uh, what? Yeah, uh, I think. Yeah, maybe. Uh, you should try out. By the way, call this number now. You know, it was a recruitment number. And that guy came out and gave me a PT test within the next couple of days at language school. What language was it? Persian Farsi. Yeah. And no, I don't speak it. <laughs> <laughs> and then no, this is, I never spoke it. <laughs> and this is uh, like the late 80s or 90? This is 80. Oh, God. You know what I mean? 89. 89. Okay. 89. Or 90. It's 90. Yep. Yeah. And I'm so I'm a Fort Bragg at the old Smoke Bomb Hill and those old World War II barracks and stuff at the time, trying to learn Persian Persian Farsi. And then uh, they came over and said, hey, "You should check it out." So I did the PT test and I got accepted to go uh, to selection in the spring of '90. And so in Christmas of '89, uh, I got stationed at fifth fifth group at Fort Campbell, and they were all deployed to the first Gulf War. So it's me and another guy in 2nd Battalion and 5th Group running everything. Nobody was there. I was non-deployable because I had a selection date. Really? So I was pissed. Yeah. You know, like, I want to go to war, man, but I had a selection date. They're like, nope, you're non-deployable. Yeah. So they held me for the selection date. Sergeant Major 5th Group's like, you're never, you're never going to make it. And when you come back here, you're going to be in group engineers and do nothing but paint road signs. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Yeah. I better make it, right? <laughs> I better fucking make it. And then I came back and I was painting the curbs and shit because he'd already put me in group engineers and, and I was painting signs and shit. And he walked by, I told you you wouldn't make it. I told you you wouldn't make it. And now you're stuck here doing it. I go, well, sir, I made you right about one thing. <laughs> you know, I'm never going to do this again, ever. Because I did make it. He's like, oh, well. And I just turned and walked away, man. I was like, I'm done with this dude, you know. Yeah. I packed up and moved down. Um, probably two weeks later, I was gone. Back to Fort Bragg. So you went through selection first and didn't make it? No, no, I made it. Um, mm -hmm. Went to selection in the spring of 89 and made it and then went back to Fort Campbell to wait for, you know, the start date. Oh, okay. Probably about two months, maybe two months away from the selection date you start, yeah. I think. So, and, uh, yeah, he was just sitting there fucking with me thinking I didn't make it. Yeah. So uh, with the selection, um, especially back then, there was so little information. I mean, not that there's a lot about it now, but uh, but there's at least, a, you know, people know a little bit more about what to expect or what have you. Um Going into it, I mean, did you have any idea what you were getting into, or was it 
total fly by the seat of your pants. I, I flew by the seat of my pants. I didn't read books. I could have read Delta Force or Inside Delta Force or whatever. Those books that people like when I got there, like I read this and I read that. And I know a little bit. I'm like, oh my god, there's shit out there about this. Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. I just showed up and uh, I knew nothing. And I just did what they told you to do or wrote down what you should do because nobody talks to you. And it was one of those. Well, fuck it. I'll do exactly what that board says and not more, not less, you know? So that's what, exactly what that board tells me to do. So that's one of the components is they actually, they, they don't talk to you at all. They never talk to you. Um, they'll give you classes, but like when they come to the, the barracks where you stay and that's where you're supposed to, you know, around the barracks and you're only allowed to go down this road so far and you don't go past this and that's, that's, that's it. That's for you. And they'll come in and they'll sneak in. I don't know when they sneak in, man. And right on the board. And it starts out military. Formation, 0800, boots, BDUs, PC, you know, blah, blah, blah. All military shit. And you're like, oh, I know exactly what to do. And you do that. And you show up and you're in a formation because that's what it said. And then it trickles down. And, and some people don't notice. Some people can't be not military, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what they want. They want to make sure that you can be normal. And I was, I was so ready to be normal, right? And uh, you'd have people like, we need to line up. And you get this assemble out back around eight. And that's, that's what you get like two weeks later. It would say okay, around didn't, eight. Yeah, around eight, assembly out back. Know, just be there, you know? I'm like, well, it doesn't say what to wear. So I'm going to wear flip-flops and shorts because it's hot. It doesn't say formation. Come on, sit over here on the curb and wait. It says around eight. So I'll get there around eight. And fuck, I don't care, you know? <laughs> And some dudes out there screaming at people, get in line, some officer, right? Get in fucking line, line up with formation. Where's your uniform? I'm like, oh, fuck you. You're not in charge. They took our rank off, our name tags off. Everybody's just a candidate, you know? I said, look, this said around eight formation. Didn't say what to say. I'm like, oh, no, you don't know what you're doing, you know? Well, no, I'm here, right? I made it, and that guy didn't. It was one of those uptight things where yeah. somebody had to be in charge, and I think they're trying to break it out of you to see who can just go with it, you know? Yeah, and think outside the box a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and just take the information given to you and not turn it into something else, you know, yeah. just assemble out back around eight. Yeah. That's easy. Yeah. You know, somebody wants to turn it into some crazy shit. Yeah. It's almost like a, who can not overthink things. It's not that hard. Yeah. I mean, there's enough hard shit in life that yeah. meeting out back around eight is not that yeah. hard. You, you know, have, you have to make it more hard than it. Already yeah. Is. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, not knowing what to expect and uh, you know, I don't know that anything did anything surprise you N not really knowing what what was going to happen was did anything stand out as like holy shit we're doing what you know how professional it was not knowing then I've run selection three times since or three or four since then not run it but been part of it yeah. of the cadre the professionalism of the cadre the timing when they say we'll be there at eight o'clock in the morning or the formation is at eight you're, you're there at 8, you know, you're going to leave at 8.15. The trucks show up at 8.14. They literally roll down the road and they park right at 8.14. And they give you a minute to load up. And, they, and at 8.15, those trucks are moving. If you're not in the truck, it's on you. The professionalism of the timing, they're perfect on their timing. It's never a mistake. And, I mean, when, I, when you run it down the road, you know, you see all the shit behind the scenes that goes on. You're crazy. Your hair's on fire, you know. And then you show up and you're like, it's nothing. It was all easy to get here, you know. Yeah. But the candidates only see perfection. Yeah. And I noticed that right away. You notice um, they're never late, not even a second late. They're always on time. They're always perfect. They're always doing the same thing. And, and, and the answers are so aloof that they put it back on you. And they, you know, what do you think? <laughs> and you're like, yeah. oh, fuck, what does that mean? You, know? you ask a question, <laughs> oh, what do you think? Oh, do what you think is best. You're like, well, <laughs> fuck, I don't know what that is to you. And I'm trying to impress you, you know, so... It was one of those things where they don't tell you anything. They just give you that information that you need at the time that you need it. You know, their thing is you'll be told what you need to know when you need to know it. Yeah. Other than that, don't worry about it. And that's what I did. And for some people, that's impossible. Well, they can't do it. Yeah. You know, I probably can't do it now, but back then I could do it pretty good. <laughs> now I'm like, I need to know everything, you know, but back yeah. then I'm like, what? fuck it, I don't care. Yeah. You know, and I, I was terrified to go. I was yeah. terrified to go to SFAS, SF, you know, SFQC. I was terrified to go to that jump school. I'm sick to my stomach in the bathtub the night before. Like, oh, I'm going to fail, you know. And then, and then you get there and you're like, oh, this isn't shit. You know, this isn't yeah. shit. What was all to worry about? Yeah. 
Um, did any, was anything uh, super difficult for you? Like, did, did anything stand out as you either failing or almost failing or it being like a total kick in the nuts more than you, you thought? No, and I hate to say that, I was in pretty good shape. I was a young 150-pound kid that could do anything. Um, yeah. I was in the perfect weight. I was in shape. My feet were tough. The lengths of the movements threw me off. You know, they grow every day, and they don't tell you. You know, today you have three points. Tomorrow you have four points. The next day you got five. And you're like, next day, oh, I'll have six. No, you go to nine. You're like, what the fuck? You know, it throws you off. They, they set it up to where... They're messing with your brain to see what you do, throwing you off a pattern once you pick it up, and they know what they're doing. But the distances get longer and longer, and the fact that you don't know the times, you don't know how you're doing, you don't see the same people the next day. They move them around, so you, and you think they're gone. So if you came with friends, you're like, we're going to do this together, and you're like, you don't see him after day two. You're like, I guess he, he didn't make it, you know, or, or did he make it? I don't know. And so they pull you away, and they put you – by yourself all the time you know you can talk to people at base camp at night but really you can't talk about certain things you can't talk about your routes how you did it what you did your times or anything do they have cadre there to monitor that yeah there's a cadre everywhere man. Yeah. you know when i went through selection i thought these fuckers are magic you know and then you realize oh well the channelization of the land and the trails and everything because you're never supposed to walk on a trail or within 200 meters of a trail and so it was one of those you stand down there where all the everything converges. The land just drives you there. The trees drive you there. The water drives you there. Everybody goes there. And you just stand there off on the side, sitting on a log. And you'll see a candidate come run. You can see him pop out on the trail, like checking his compass. They look and they look. Oh, the trail goes exactly where I need to go. And they look off to the left and right where their map goes, and it's just shit. So they take off running down the trail, and you're like, you just step out, color number. Look, oh fuck. Just got busted, and you think you're going to get pulled right away. You know, it's just a little note. Yeah. Because you know they're there. So, cadre know where to stand. They know typically where people drift into and how to fuck with them and let them know that we're always there. Uh, and to where everybody thinks there's cameras everywhere. There's cameras in the trees, man. They're watching everything you do because they know everything you do because they run it for a while and they yeah. know what you're going to do. You know, yeah. I mean, they just know. Yeah. So, when you do run it, you're like, oh, I get it. It's not magic. It's just a lot of hard work. Yeah. And, uh, and, very deliberate action deliberate i mean and it's been the same since they started yeah. they, they took out a couple of things because it didn't matter but i know that um a lot of higher government people have been trying to get us to change it to allow more people to get in to make it easier for more people and the unit stood firm like no nope, that's good no nope, we'll only take out this because not everybody sees this change the pt test to like the regular military army pt test instead of the five event that they had and they moved the swim test from selection to OTC. Oh, okay. Because it's a teachable skill. When they used to have it in selection because people have drowned up there crossing streams or rivers. So it made sense at the time. Yeah. All right. So our sponsor, Masterworks, which is an art investing platform, now has 14 exits. Uh, exit is when the painting that you're invested in sells and you collect the profit. It's five exits in this year alone. Uh, it's exciting news for me personally as I do invest with Masterworks myself. Uh, most recently, there was a 17.6% net return on the last exit. Uh, every Masterworks sale to date has delivered a positive net return, 14 for 14. So, of course, as with any investment, there's no guarantee that the works for the works uh, yet to sell. Um, other recent returns include 10%, 13, and even 35% net. Uh, Masterworks enables you to invest in a painting without buying the whole thing, so you don't need millions of dollars to do so. Paintings are securitized through the SEC. Like I said, I'm also an investor. You don't need to be an art expert. That's their job. Masterworks already has tens of thousands of investors, over $800 million in assets under management. Uh, and you get special access when you use my code. Just go to masterworks.art slash mic drop to skip the wait list. Again, that's masterworks.art slash mic drop. Hurricane season is here as well as uh, incredibly hot temperatures across the country. Uh, whether it's a hurricane, a natural disaster, or power outages because of the heat, you always want to be prepared. I've been working with this company uh, for Patriots, which are survival food kits. They're hand-packed in the USA. They last for up to 25 years. They come packed inside covert storage totes so you don't have people you know, digging into your stuff. It includes a wide variety of delicious breakfast, lunch, and dinner, backed by thousands of five-star customer reviews. 
But it's not just for natural uh, disasters, um, uncertain supply chains, unpredictable emergencies. It's more important than ever to have a backup plan. Uh, and right now you can go to fourpatriots.com and use the code mic drop, all one word, to get 10% off your first purchase on anything in the store, including the emergency food supply kits that last up to 25 years. Just go to four patriots, that's the number four patriots.com, and use mic drop, one word, 10% off your first purchase. Fourpatriots.com, code mic drop. How, uh, how long is selection? Can you say? Hmm, three and a half weeks, I think. Typically, I think they say a month, depending on where you come from. Yeah, they give you time if you come from overseas to acclimate and get you know get past that you know jet lag and stuff. There's like an admin week, and then there's like probably three weeks of uh, of uh, of instructional slash um, stress, and then it goes into a week of um, you're waiting on your psych evals and shit. You know, yeah. you may go first and get home. Probably overseas people go first so they can get home. And then people who live in, in, you know, closer and closer, I ended up going towards the end of the week because I was at Fort Campbell. Yeah. And uh, I sat all week waiting, like, oh, fuck, when are they going to call me? Yeah. You're taking tests, you know, so I give out tests all week long, and they're gathering all the information. Then you go sit in front of everybody, and they ask you all these crazy fucking questions. You're like, I just want to leave, man, you know? And <laughs> they send you out of the room and call you back in, and it's yes or no. Yeah. You know, I, got, I got the yes, thank God. But yeah. It's one of those terrifying. Oh, I can know. imagine. You know the deal, man, like waiting yeah. to hear you're good enough. You yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and it seems like such a fucking mystery, you know, um, still a mystery. Do you know how many guys you started with in your, no, I would say, fuck, I would say maybe 80. Oh, wow. 80 to a hundred. Is, is that normal? Um, they, I'd say when they're good, typically around a hundred ish, you know, they have expansion barracks in case it goes up and down, but I'd say a hundred is, about the average number probably that people start at and then you know we've gone down to one one guy made it and we've gone down to i think maybe eight now probably 12 made mine yeah out of the hundred ish that came through wow and uh from from that pool i guess it's predominantly rangers and green berets but there are people that are mechanics or cooks or oh yeah do. we've had uh army band no shit. When I was running selection, we had a guy come up and I'm like, what is he, what the fuck's he bringing? He had a guitar with him. He was <laughs> from the army band. He wore jump boots, spit shined, flat bottom jump boots with not, he had better soles on him. <laughs> Dress green jump boots. Cause that's all he had. And he's an army band guy. The only reason he went was to pass advanced land nav. So he could have one up on every other body, everybody else in the band and get promoted. I thought, well, fucking hey, man, you could have done something else, man, easier than this. <laughs> He made it pretty far in selection. You know, we called him Guitar Man. He'd pick, yeah. he'd play a guitar in the in the barracks at night. We'd go, I'd go listen to him. Like, all right, put, throw that shit away. You know, after yeah. listening to him for a while. But uh, yeah, he made it pretty far with crane operators. I mean, anybody can come. Yeah. Right. Take away all that bullshit and just say, you can come. Shut up. Quit bitching. Come on. Yeah. If you make it, you make and it. if you make it, you make it. If not, yeah. well, all right. Yeah. You're great for wherever you need to be, but not here. That's no big deal. Uh, Percentage wise, if you could, if you had to ballpark it, um, guys who are outside of Rangers, Green Berets, or, or lateral transfers from other soft units, what percentage of non soft guys actually make it all the way through? <laughs> Man, 0.005%. Yeah. I mean, I don't so know. It's, it's just, happened, but it's yeah. a fucking lottery ticket. There's guys who made it. You know, there's. Yeah. Uh, We've had guys that have made it and then halfway through OTC pull out. I'm like, oh, that's fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's not what I thought. CQB is crazy. And then they left. Like, like yeah. they're doing okay, but they're like, it's too stressful. Yeah. It's too much. You know, some guys just can't get past that. Yeah. So it's, it's phased. You know, you got selection. And they start out very basic. They teach everything very basic. Like, you don't know shit. Selection's the same way. You can show up to, show up to selection and not know anything. You, I don't know how to read a map. And they're going to give you one over the world. From space all the way down to, a, you know, a 10-meter grid identifier. Mm -hmm. And teach you how to do that. And then they're going to take you out and practice with you. And they're going to let you practice by yourself and give you a tips and advice on how to do better. And then stress starts. And it's it's like, hey, I came from here and I don't, I don't really know if I... You just roll the window up. This is not your RV. And you roll the window <laughs> up. And they're like, they're standing like... Tch, tch, tch. You roll the window down. Do you need to see a medic? No. Tch, tch. This is not your RV. You know? And if they fuck around, you're like, 
do you wish to voluntarily withdraw? Because I'm not helping you. Yeah. Don't hang around here. If you don't need a medic, get the fuck out of here. You know, yeah. and that's it. You get zero help then. Yeah. How, uh, as somebody who's been through it and then been part of running it several times, how subjective is the yes, no? Man, you know, I went in the spring and, I, and I've seen it spring and fall. It's twice a year, so the temperatures are the same and the, and the foliage is the same, similar, and the, and the weather and the snow is the same. But in the spring, it's going away. In the fall, it's coming, you know. So in the spring, which I didn't know at the time, I went and there's no foliage. You can see farther. You can see the terrain versus pure foliage. I don't know what the fuck I'm looking at. You know, I can't read the terrain on the map that way. The snow, you know, was going away, so it wasn't coming for stress phase. So when you're in the field at the end, you know, hopefully the snow was gone. And I, I didn't realize it when I went, but when I went to the fall courses, I'm like, oh, the fall sucks. There's foliage still in the trees. It can be hot as shit. And then, oh, by the way, it's going to snow. And we've had that class where there was a class where they, I think they let everybody go back through. They had a huge snowstorm. And, like, two guys made it, but then one guy didn't, and they, everybody else behind him followed those footprints which in my opinion is your fuck up right you're not land nabbing anymore you're following footprints and they all fall and got lost because the snowstorm two guys made it so they like all right we're gonna give you guys another chance due to mother nature but every day and every hour you get a radio call at every rv where you're sitting what's the temperature and what time is it and what's the weather like and we all they they all jot it down and the and the timekeeper who keeps all the times and all the temperatures does whatever magic math to offset the temperature, you know, settings and standards for humans who are trying to navigate through something like that to keep it as even as possible. Okay. So there's not a secret guidebook that says this is the time for this leg. It depends on what. There is. But okay. Only, uh, only the selection sergeant major knows that. Yeah. And so there's whoever those people are, and they'll never tell it. You know, I've got best friends that are, have been that, and they won't tell. I, I don't ask. You know, yeah. it's like. There's no reason. Sitting around on the radio listening. You're like, oh, this dude's a stud. You know, you're waiting. He finished, and we're all just waiting to take people back, you know, and we're kind of sitting on the hood of the vehicle listening to the radio. Hey, Blue 32 just checked into his last RV. You hear the time people stand by. You're like, oh, this dude's making it. This dude's been kicking ass the whole time, you know. He's been great. And we're all making bets on the hood of the vehicle, you know. And then the time comes back. Uh, he is a time goes here. I mean, a time standard. Put him in the other truck. And we're like, what the fuck? You know, somebody else come in and be like, oh, we think this guy's doing shitty. You're like, all right, move him on to the, you know, middle base camp. You're like, whoa. So you never know the magic, but it always ends up just right. You know, it's like uh, they've broken it down to the science that I don't know. That they understand the weather, the distance, the time from start to finish, meaning the day you got there to the day you leave, not just stress, but all of that averages in. And all of that matters. And all of that ends up with one long thing that tells them who you are. And they look at that and they're like, okay, he's moldable. He's usable. He's strong and he's tough. And I want that guy versus, you know, somebody else who might, def- you know, fight against something or whatever. Yeah. But so for, let's say, halfway through the, the selection, if you're off on time one time, that's it. No. Nope. Sometimes no. they'll let it go. Yeah, there, people get lost, you know. you are been lost, you're going to get lost, blah, blah, blah. But um, I, I remember the time, one time I got lost, and I, I realized I'd gone down the wrong finger, and I just kept following it. Like, this is it, you know. And then you make it fit. You're like, oh, this is this is right, this is it. And you keep looking at the map going, yeah, yeah. And then you realize you're fucked up. Yeah. I took off running, man. I mean, I, I, I'm on a lot. I was parallel on a road. Like, I got I to gotta get there, man. Fuck, you know. As soon as you think that, you're thinking, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm never going to make it. They're going to pull me. I was running. I was throwing up. I was running all over. Here comes one of those trucks. I'm like, dive down and hide because if I get caught, I'm fucked, you know? Yeah. Goes by, jump up, keep off running, you know? And I, and I finally found my RV and made it, and he just sent me to the base camp. I'm like, fuck, I don't even know what happened. But you get lost. You have a good day of getting lost. It's no big deal. Yeah. You have two days. It's a big deal. You know, it's, uh, you didn't learn from it, I guess. Yeah. Or it's just bad luck for you, and yeah. come try again. Man, yeah. You know? But So the entire process is kind of its own criteria. It's not necessarily one day so i guess that, that's kind of my my question is is the subjectivity ultimately lies in, in the timekeeper right is that like yeah you can't beat that and, and you can't beat the distance is all the same unless you add on you know distance which means you're adding on time the averages of the time with the weather of that day 
they'll either give you more time or less depending on the weather if it's too hot you get more if it's too cold you get more if it's beautiful you know you probably get less and and then that all is just compiled over the time that you're there and then whatever magic bones they throw in the end um decides that yep i don't you know i don't even know if, if the timekeeper knows the real reason they're just given like the times and this and that and they do the math and there's a calculator involved i've seen them doing that and they're like nope i mean yeah, what the fuck numbers are you punching in there man yeah because that guy was a stud yeah i mean well, all, all the way to the point of if a stud makes it to the final board he's done all his psychological evaluations he did great he kicked ass i've sat on boards before where a dude came in and he, and he kicked ass he broke records you know and then but you ask him some questions and he can't answer it the way you want to hear it. it's like no i don't want him i don't want that guy either you know yeah it's physical stud but it's not what it's about either right that's yeah everything put together yeah. yeah well because you know in the seal teams there it, at least you know this is back a lot has changed since i got got my trident but you know, you go through uh, a process where, yes, there's all these boxes that have to be checked and, and not checking them is automa you're automatically out. But kind of similarly, like you go to this chief's board where you're sitting, standing, and there's like 15 salty E7, E8, E9 dudes that have been in 20 plus fucking years that are fucking with you, tell you know, yeah. asking you morality questions, operational questions. They can ask you anything. Yeah. Some of it's super technical. Some of it's you know, you catch your fucking buddy fucking somebody else's wife. What are you going to do about, you know, all kinds of shit yeah. like that. Um, and then at the end of the day, then they're like, all right, get the fuck out of here. And then they talk about it. And, and, and sometimes I wouldn't say often, but sometimes it's like, no, that guy isn't for us. I mean, did everything they needed to do. So I guess that, that I was curious, like there, there's a level of almost anonymity in the timekeeper where if depending on who that guy is, like if he didn't like somebody, he could say, no, nope, you didn't make the time. Like nobody's going to know. Right. Yeah, I think there's a big there's a big chart of I mean all the times are kept at all the stations and all the weather's written down and everything's jotted down at everywhere you go. The okay. timekeeper pulls in all the information and uses that to do his math, and then the selection and training sergeant major, who's over the selection sergeant major, will then do the same thing with that and recap okay. that and make sure that that's all standard. Could you do it? Maybe. 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 I mean, people can do anything. Man. Yeah. Hey, fuck that dude, you know? And, and, yeah. and I don't know. Yeah. Nobody, I mean, somebody would know, though. Somebody's always checking on the time. So it's yeah. not like one guy has it and that's it. I, I mean, you. he has it and he, only, he knows the secret, but there's people above him that are doing yeah. it as well. But then at the end of the day, if if they just don't like somebody, you're not getting in. Mm, I, I no, mean, there's a lot of people I don't like the guy. Yeah. <laughs> the guy well, there's, there's a lot of people that that I may not have liked that I, I let in as well. Yeah. Just they met this. They weren't fucking ruining the board or something you know and it was like all right and then they're getting like i don't know but the key phrase at the unit of selection is an ongoing process every day every day you swipe your card it's going to turn green green or red are there and times it, where guys show up and it turns red yeah, and you're just fucking done yeah yeah and, and that they, that's they can't their get indicator in. they can't get in oh man. shit get on the phone what the fuck hey your stuff will be brought to you at the gate wow you know and it's 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 uh that's rare yeah but everybody talks about the stress of because you you go in the gate man. green then there's a guard then you park, and then you want to go in the bay. And then you want to go out of the bay. You want to go to Chow. You want to get out of Chow. You keep swiping that fucking card. Dude, that's fucking like And if it turns red, you're like, what the fuck? Yeah. And it's turned red before. Like, your card, you didn't swipe it right, or, or something's off with yeah. your card. And you're like, swipe it. It goes red, and you're like, all right, I guess man. I'm done. Swipe it again. You're like, all right. You start looking at the cameras in the hallway. You're like, oh, what the fuck? What <laughs> and somebody comes, swipes it, and they're like, hey, what's up? And you, you go in the bay, and you're like, hey, my fucking card's fucked up. What's up? And like, oh, yeah, you better go get it checked out. I'm not fired, right? And like, no, no, no. Go get your card yeah. checked out. I'm like, all right. All right Holy man. shit. Just check in. Dude, it's a stressful wild, situation, man. man. That is fucking wild. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that I can't think of a better tactic to, uh, to keep people fucking on their toes, though. Like, I mean, there, there's no more. I mean, it's a constant reminder of. Yeah of where you're at like every i mean multiple times a day that's fucking wild they love that selections ongoing oh, like, man forever imagine. and like forever yeah forever <laughs> so having been through that selection and, and then again running it do you feel lo kind of looking back now decades later that, that that selection is what it should be and and is super accurate to find the right guys for that job yeah i think it is yeah. that's over the years the 20 years that i was there the, the right guys kept getting in yeah Every now and then you get a guy in there, you know, that just doesn't cut it personality wise, but he got in and he did good for a bit and then maybe he got comfortable, who knows, but yeah. then let people go. But 
it's always been pretty pretty spot on yeah. you know um yeah. the guys you get you trust and then the, the training after that you get a man you're like all right you're gonna learn a lot you got a lot to learn but it's a good starting point for you you know because yeah. you get there and you think i'm badass and then you get with your team on day one like all right we're going to cqb they're going whoa what happened they're done already like i didn't even start yeah like you got a lot to learn you're like yeah. damn i thought i was badass until i saw you guys you know and it gets scary to catch up yeah and then when you're doing it that that fast, all that all that training, and you you get that good, and then I, I left towards the end of my career, and I was working at Range Thirty Seven teaching CQB for the SF, and I brought them back to the unit to do some hits on some of the compound out there, and we were waiting and watching another squadron, my old squadron, go through. Before we went through, um, I got scared watching them. I forgot how fast it was. Yeah. After about a year and a half with uh, the SF guys, I got in there and I was like, "Holy shit!" You get nervous watching like somebody's gonna get killed. This is dangerous. Yeah. You know, and then you realize, oh, man, they're just flowing through like nobody's business, man. Yeah. They don't care. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, so the, the the selection of three and a half, four weeks, uh, and then OTC is how long? Uh, six months. Six months? Yeah. Is, is six there, months plus, you know. Yeah. And you cover, that's kind of like uh, Dev Group's green team, kind of a similar pipeline, um, although theirs is, is selection and training all in one. They don't have the... I guess you could consider becoming a SEAL there selection to, you know, first, but um, is there a, a ballpark percentage of the people who make it through selection that don't make it through OTC? Hmm. No, it wouldn't be that many. Not many. I, mean, I don't think it'd be that many. There, there's guys that leave. Um, and you know what, man, there's a percentage. I mean, it's on the board because it's safety. Safety's a lot. Yeah. You know, you, you're, if you're doing the wrong thing one or two times, if you're shooting the wrong target too many times. I mean, I remember my first day of CQB. Uh, they didn't give, they didn't, I don't remember being taught much. You know, MP5, running around, grease guns and shit, you know. And that's, uh, I just dated myself, didn't I? But they fill the room <laughs> full of, like, day one. All right, you're one guy, you're two, you're three, four. You go in, you turn left, right, left, right. You do this, you do that. Easy, right? I fuck, that's easy, man. You guys do this shit. And you go in, you look at all the targets and and... Every one of them has a gun. You know, like, yeah, all right, all right, all right. Go back out. You come in, you shoot every one of them. Yeah, yeah, good job. It's easy. All right, go back out. We'll do it one more time. They switched every target in the room. Nobody had a gun, right? Not one target in the room had a weapon. We enter the room, start smoking the shit out of everybody. It's like, yeah, yeah, did all right, man. It's fucking easy. He's like, yeah. One more time, and you're fucking out of here. And you're like, what? And you look, and not one person had a gun. They all got two holes inside their head and shit. And you're like, yeah. So you don't fucking ever shoot an unarmed target, ever. I was like, oh, this is real. Yeah. Damn. So after that, it was like that pause, you know, that pause before you pull the trigger because it matters, you know. Yeah. It's just, they just straight in, teach you how to do it, and then fuck with you if you don't do it right. And then they, don't, they give you that chance, you know. Yeah. Wow. Either either keep up or get out. Yeah. Um, so the, the percentage is low of guys that, that don't make it or that, that make it through selection and then, you know, ultimately go through OTC. For you, once you tra uh, got through OTC, do you feel like at that point, like now, okay, yeah, I'm a fucking badass, or is it still now you go to the, the squadron and you're like, Jesus Christ, I still have a lot to learn? Both. I yeah. thought I was a badass, right? I'm yeah. here to help you guys. You yeah. know, <laughs> the first thing my team leader told me when I got, I'm going to drug my bags down the hall, you know, hey, you got this, you got that, and then you're going to go to C squadron. I'm like, or they asked me first, is there a squadron you'd like to go to? And me, I was like swallowing, I'm like, oh shit, I don't want to piss anybody off. I said, I don't know, I don't know where I want to go. I said, if anything, I'd say A, because I have a friend in A. That's all I know. Yeah. So I went to C. But um, <laughs> Is there it, any difference? Uh, like, do they special? Personality-wise. Yeah. But did you know that? No, I didn't know that. I just picked A because of a friend. Yeah. I, I knew a guy in A, so, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I went to C uh, due to need, obviously, and um, drug my bags down there. My team leader walked in, and they're like, hey, he's on his way out to Lebanon, you know, but... He'll be gone for four months, but your two SC will find you. And he, oh, by the way, here's your team leader. He come walking. I go, hey, hey, I'm your new guy. He goes, looks at me, shook me, and he goes, "You got a lot to learn." And he left. That's all he said to me. You got a lot. I saw him four months later. You know, when he got back, and the two IC took us down and you know started training us up and stuff. But yeah, you think you know everything. You're like, how can I help you? Yeah. And they're like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I want to kill you right now. You know, you're like, damn. Yeah. yeah. I want to fit in. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, so based on the numbers, you're only running two two selections, two OTCs a year. I mean, so Delta Force as an entity is really only gaining anywhere from a handful to maybe 20 at the most guys a year. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've in my time, we were never full. Yeah. Never had a full team. What Somalia full popped team? up. I didn't have a six. 
I never had a full team. Yeah. We had to take people from other squadrons to fill our team up to go to Somalia. Wow. Um, how long had you been at the unit uh, when Somalia popped off? <clears throat> Two years, but um, so I went in 91. So I went to selection in 91. Um, so 92, so about a year. Yeah. End of 91, I was uh, in a squadron, you know, and we went to uh, you know winter training in Jackson Hole. And I thought, oh, this is fucking amazing. Yeah, going skiing as part of army training, you know. Yeah. And then some of the guys were waiting around. We're going to go out into the field for like four days, and some older guys were like, "Hey, man, the Super Bowl's coming up, but we're going to miss that shit." We're like, oh, never mind. We'll cancel this. And I'm like, what the fuck's going on here, man? Pizza party at the hotel for the Super Bowl. I like this shit, you know. And then we went out and did all that crazy, horrible shit. But that was my first trip. But it was about a year, you know. And then and then we started prepping for Somalia, you know. And then I did some other stuff um, down south before that. Um, in in that year ninety three, but then boom, you know it all kicked off. So probably a year in a squadron. When yeah, in in that year, you know, finish OTC, spend a year training. Were you stateside that entire time? Just no, training? I went down south for a little bit on a on a on a small mission. Right? Can you talk about that at all? Mm, no, I don't. Um, it was just a small me and uh, probably five of us total going down there doing like RSTs, regional surveillance, you know, teams and stuff and hotel stuff, but. The reasons, you know, I can't talk about. Yeah. Just. Yeah. But that was my first, like, international trip with people. And it was, like, just us. Just yeah. four people. I'm like, who's in charge? Oh, you are. You're on the same team <laughs> I'm on, man. Shit. Who's the real guy in charge? You know, where's yeah. mom and dad? Yeah. And that's kind of when I, I realized, wow, you know, there's some things that happened down there that um, terrified me, that, that made me wake up like I'm in the real world. Yeah. Like, I'm in the real world. Now, this isn't. Grand Theft Auto or fucking some video game. This is no shit, you know, to where I've had a, a, a G3 gun barrel stuck in my mouth. Down there. And I'm like, down there, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm t- like yelling at the driver, like, calm down, man. Just just this roadblock ain't going well, you know, and he's trying to get his get out of jail free card, you know, and I'm like, oh, this dude's got his gun barrel in my mouth, man. I'm not cool. Yeah. Damn. To where I realized how oh, the shit we're doing is not fun sometimes. Did you guys uh, actually mix it up down there or was it mostly passive? I never did. Yeah. I never mixed it up down there. It was it was sketchy, but never. Yeah. You know, I didn't trade shit with anybody. Yeah. You guys know I used to dip. I was in the Navy for 12 years and just about all of us did. Uh, one of the nice things about a company I'm working with is called Black Buffalo. It's a tobacco alternative. You know, they, they've got two different product types. Both are available in long cut and in pouches. All are made from the same base ingredients. You got edible green leaves, food grade ingredients, and no tobacco leaf or stem. Uh, they come in wintergreen, mint, straight, peach, or blood orange. I've tried all of them. They're all tasty and delicious. The biggest thing is, is you get that same ritual of, of packing a fat dip after a meal or while you're on the range, road tripping, uh, whatever, uh, without it actually having tobacco. Uh, they also have uh, some blends uh, or blends with nicotine and without. So uh, you kind of get the best of both worlds where you can uh, pick and choose. The good news is also that, uh, you know, Black Buffalo is available in thousands of locations. It's uh, it's at Pilot Wawa Sheets, Racetrack. It's all over the place. So, uh, or you can, again, go right to the website, blackbuffalo.com, and use the promo code Mike Drop. Two words, mic drop, uh, and get a good good bundle for you. Redefine the tradition. Uh, it's still a good tradition to, to pack that fat dip, but, um, you know, do it with, uh, with a little less anxiety about what you're putting in your mouth. Warning. This product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Black Buffalo products are intended for adults age 21 and older who are consumers of nicotine or tobacco. So you come back, you're getting ready for Somalia. Somalia kicks off. Can you kind of walk us through what that was like? Yeah. It's the hardest shit I ever did. 30 years later, right? Yeah. Fucking hits me. Um, yeah, the first five missions were like, you know, no shit. Let's go. It's fucking, we're America, man. We win everything. We're the good guys, right? Um, and you go in there and the first five missions were just making noise, shooting at me, you know, not even shooting at people. You hear bullets flying back and forth and we win the day, right? On um, the fourth hit, or the fifth hit was Otto, Osman Otto. And uh, that was one of those, you know, they hit the, the guys hit the ground. We were supposed to circle the top again. I'm like, fuck, I hate circling the helicopter. You know, and I went on the ground. And then a gunfight broke out. So we roped right into the intersection and, and just took off. And I remember there was a machine gun nest a block up. And me and my buddy hit, our whole team hit the ground. But me and my buddy were like, looked at each other. I'm like, 
near ambush. Fuck that up. It was a far ambush, right? Near ambush, rush it. So we start rushing down this, this alleyway with walls on both sides, nowhere to get out of the way. And bullets are just skipping off the ground, man, around us. And I'm, I'm running thinking, and the guy in front of me is taller than I was. And I'm already thinking, oh, as soon as he gets hit and goes down, I'm next, man. It's just waiting for that. Finally found our, our, ourself to a spot and opened up and took out that nest and shit. And that was just one of those, okay, that amped it up a bit. And I think I took somebody's life on Xfil from the second floor. He was getting to shoot at our helicopter on the third floor. And, and I, I, I shot, he didn't even see me. Um, and that was like my first, like, whoa, no shit. Like I looked at him across the street and he, he didn't look at me. He had no idea I was there. And drilled him right in the head, and he just f- fell back. Gun falls out the window. I'm like, holy shit. You know, like, fuck. I'm calling for my team leader. I'm like, Pete, Pete, did you see that shit? I just shot that fucker in the face. He goes, all right, good job. Keep doing your job. <laughs> I'm like, fuck, this guy doesn't get excited about shit. <laughs> you know, and then uh, you go back, and you're like, man, that was scary as shit still. But here we are. We made it. Yeah, we won again. And then 3 October, you know. There, that's that, that's when everything changed when... Um, Right on infill, getting shot at. And RPGs through the helicopters and getting shot at. And guy falls 90 feet. You know, you hear that on the radio. We got infilled outside of the perimeter. So we had to take a house down under fire and fight our way in. Um, grabbed all the detainees, moved them, getting ready to exfil them. And then the, the, the five ton gets hit with an RPG and blows up. And then, and then a ranger sitting next to a gate, just taking a break. His neck explodes. I'm like, fuck. This is growing. And then I hear an RPG and I look up and I see the helicopter spinning out of control off to the west. I'm like, fuck me. You know, and I'm still trying to make jokes. Like, we're going to make a home for dinner, right? Like, still dinner, right? You know, I didn't bring night vision. I didn't bring water. I didn't bring shit. In and out in an hour. That's what we were always at. Uh, ended up fighting our way down the street, you know, um, to the crash site. And then just spent 18 hours there that whole night. was just, uh, that's when I, I mean, it was hell on earth. I, I don't know even how to explain it to people who won't just it's wasted on people who don't have a clue right i guess to to not to interrupt um to compare it to the way the movie depicts it how, how would you contrast it hmm. you know when you watch the movie after being there you're like oh it's kind of funny i didn't see half that shit you know and they were like yeah. was all that true and i go i don't know i mean maybe some of that was true because i i, I was of course War scenes are all similar and the same. I mean, you shot up an RPG. What country was that in? It's all the same. Um, it caught the chaos. It caught um, probably some of the humor, and it caught the fear, I think. Um, could it ever really, you know, show somebody what it's like? No. It's, but I think it, it got close. I've been able to watch it since the first time I watched it. I, I've tried with Jen a couple of times, and it's one of those things I get into. Like She's like, you sure you want to watch that? I'm like, yeah, it just popped up. You know, fuck it. Let's watch this shit. And I know those people, so it's not a movie to me. It's a reenactment. I just, I just kind of break down. I can't do it because yeah. it's a lot of loss in one, you know, one day. Yeah. Did uh, did the movie, from your perspective, I know it's been a while since you've watched it. Did it miss anything that stands out? Like you know, yeah, the movie was told from a ranger perspective. Um, you couldn't really talk to you know Delta guys about it. Um, there was a couple that were involved due to them getting out, but it was mostly ranger stories, so a lot of the people in the movie are, are doing scenes as a ranger that unit guys did, you know, so that one guy might do three things that three people did, you know, just to kind of catch it, or the ranger saw an event happen, so they're trying to depict that in the movie as what they think happened, so they missed a lot of, um, like, internal shit from our, from our unit's perspective, what we did up on the front edge of that, because they were kind of behind, can you share any of that? Um, there was a lot of animosity about why we weren't out in the street, all of us, you know. And I think it was a leadership breakdown that 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 was the the scuttle <laughs> back in the day. You know, I don't want to get into that because I'm I'm not the guy. I was a young kid then. My job is to break shit and shoot people. Man, I wasn't in charge of anything. Hearing the stories down the road years later and talking to people, it was like, yeah, there was a breakdown. There was some people screaming, you know, cowardice and, and poor leadership on the other side, but um. You know, I wasn't down there, right? I wasn't down there. I didn't see it. And I've learned to talk about what I did and what I saw happen. But other than that, not to guess because that's someone else's opinion possibly. But a lot of talk about the breakdown in leadership and how we could have used more people out on the street versus just the few that we had that were going out and doing things. Like when my team leader was like, hey, we need someone to run ammo across here. I'm like, fuck. Hey, we need someone to run water across here. I'm like, fuck, I hate being the new guy, you know? 
I was a new guy, but there was a newer guy that he got blown up. So he's laying in the living room, you know, recovering. I'm the guy running across the street under fire, like, fuck, being the new guy sucks, you know? And where's, where's the younger, the lower ranking people? Where are those yeah. guys at? They were down the street. But um, they didn't talk about that. I don't, I don't think that that was a story that was told. Yeah. Um, I don't think this is a story people want to tell, right? It makes us look bad versus real. But I think they captured um, most of it, I think, you know? Yeah. I don't think they captured the anger after. You're flying a deed around in airplanes and shit and, like, back to negotiations and, you know, of course you're pissed off, you know? Yeah. But that's our job. Yeah. Yeah, that 18-hour period that you guys were... I'm not going to say pinned down, but in, in one area. No, we are pinned down. Yeah. <laughs> I'd have left if I could. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, Loadout-wise, you didn't have water, you didn't have night vision. Armament-wise, what were you guys carrying, and, and what was your loadout mag-wise? Like, were you similarly lightly loaded down? Basic load, 210 rounds, 5.56. Oh. I probably had five 45 magazines, you know, one one in and you know, four on my hip. And I, I carried a shotgun, too like a little shotgun. So I had that ammo going for me as well. Um, that was it. That's typical what people had. Some had sniper rifles, but I mean, most of us had kind of the similar thing. Some guys would have 203s and things like that, but it's kind of it. Everybody carries their grenades and whatnot, but yeah, 210, the basic low is all we went in with. I mean, we were, back in the day, it was one of those, in and out, man. Yeah. We're the unit, bro. We're in and out, man. You know, and then, boom. You're like, fuck, we weren't ready for that. You yeah. know, it was one of those, uh, it's a big learning moment. A real big learning moment, I think, for a lot of the Army and definitely for us. For me, you know, um, maybe the unit was repeating things, I don't know, but for me it was one of those, whoa, don't have helicopters over overhead. It's kind of like telling everybody where you're at, mm -hmm. you know, and plus there's somebody to shoot down there. You know, bring your nods, bring water. Don't ever think you're going to go in and out. There's always prepare for the worst, you know. It's one of those, um, we're, we're hostage rescue people, man, you know. We don't stick around. No, but when you don't think about the option that, that might be taken from you. You know, the enemy has a vote. Yeah. We were just kind of stuck and we unprepared. I would, you know, at my age at then, I would say we were unprepared. I don't think anybody would argue that. Yeah. When, uh, during that period, were there, uh, waves of, of gunfights? Uh, was it like, can you, can you kind of go through the, the, that period? Uh, I know we don't have time to spend 18 hours talking about it, but uh, <laughs> there but, were waves. It was, um, you could hear the, the the commander in the air flying around telling us, you know, our ISR telling us, hey, there's a huge group of people forming on the outskirts of town. They're loading in vehicles. Oh, they're heading your way. And you're like, fuck. You know, and you'd hear that all night long. And then there'd be a wave of people going through and shooting at you and, and launching RPGs and trying to sneak up on you. And then that would kind of go away a little bit. You'd notice the volume was trickling down. At one point, two dudes walking down the street right into the middle of our intersection. Me and my buddy were laying at the gate. And he's like, Jake's like, hey, look at those fuckers. You know, you could barely see them. One had an AK over his shoulder. They're just chatting like they forgot where we were. He's like, what, what the fuck do we do? He's like, I'm going to light them up, you know, with this flashlight. And he lit them up just to make them do something because we won't shoot anybody unless it's a threat. And he just had his gun over his shoulder, right? Yeah, I mean, right? <laughs> so... He lights him up with the flashlight so that dude pulls his weapon off his shoulder because that's what I would do. And then we lit him up. You know? And then one guy took off running. I ran to the next window to try to shoot him. And he's, he's dropping the guy in the street. And it was one of those, they just keep coming, man. They're on cot. They're drugged out. And they're just rounding them up out of town. They're bringing them in. And they, whether they know what they're doing or not, I don't know. But giving them weapons and coming at us, it just kept coming in waves after wave of the volume would pick up. You know, the house was getting broken down by RPGs as they would get close enough to hit the house. And tear down that wall and i'm thinking fuck the next one's coming into the living room man you know so yeah those waves kept coming to the point of um i asked my team leader one time uh you could hear the convoy trying to make it to you as well with the 50 cows roaring and you could hear the gunfire coming at him and and i said hey are they gonna make it and he just looked at me he's like no i don't know and he turned and walked out like here goes my fucking team leader again you know, no motivational speech at all yeah. just i don't know just yeah. the truth just always just the truth i don't know and that's the moment I was like, well, all right, okay. And I got happier, like, fuck it. I'm yeah. dead, right? I'm dead. So let's just go, right? It was kind of like that fear was gone. Like, uh, yeah, you're going to die, so let's just do as much as you can while you're alive. Wow. 
that had to be a, a sobering moment life-wise and and one that that changes your perspective forever i imagine yeah to this day yeah to this very moment it's, it's uh yeah it ruined me yeah the uh the waves i mean it sounds reminiscent of like the fucking walking dead <laughs> yeah. i mean especially like they're doped up on cot and they're just, they're almost fucking zombie like mental state wise. Is that kind of what it was like? It's just like the, these waves of fucking erratic people that, that are walking into being mowed down. Yeah. And, and I kept wondering like, why are they, why do they continue to come? Do they not see the first group of people? You know, you'd so shoot people and you'd see your tracers going through them and they just kept coming. And I'm like, it's like, are we not hitting the right spots? I mean, are they so skinny? Are they drugged up? I mean, it's just, it was one of those things where you shoot, I mean, you know, you, you double tap and you move on to the next target in training. You know, I, I learned, no, no, I'm going to empty 10 or 15 into you because the 5.56 five, doesn't kill you right now. You know? Yeah. I'm going to have to hit something important and I'm going to keep looking for it till I find it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, were there just piles of bodies piling up? Uh, they would drag them back, um, you know? I mean, there was... The close in ones, sure, they would stay there, you know, and, and, and on the run out, the mile run out, I would see people dead laying around and shit. But yeah. the numbers that they were they're taking out with the little birds and the rockets and shit, I mean, they, they were hauling them away. I didn't get out to see the, if they were still there on the streets, you know, where they were trying to come in. But there, I mean, there weren't, I didn't see, it wasn't stacks of bodies. It was just, I know that they were dragging people back. Yeah. And I know the hospitals, you know, you could hear the radios, the hospitals were filling up. Yeah. Um, did you guys did any of you guys run out of ammo yeah we all did i know i did yeah. I, I had my knife on the bed at one point like fuck wow. you know and then got an ammo resupply which exploded in the street right there trying to scrap up you know ammo out of the dirt and then pass it around and then ran out again and so when i ran out the next morning i probably had one mag left and i emptied that and i was picking up magazines on the road there'd be three and i'd knock dirt out of it stick it in my weapon and you know and shoot at whatever i saw and then find another mag down the street and there'd be one or two or three in it and knock the dirt out and use it, you know, until I got back to the Humvee finally and we loaded up. I'm like, all right, you're going to go in this Humvee, you're going to head this way, you know, there's tanks and Pakistani BMPs and shit everywhere. And, and I was like, all right, I feel good now. There were tanks launching into the streets and I was like, whoa, I've never seen tanks shoot before, man. They were just shooting at everything and um, grabbed more ammo on the, on the vehicle. And that's That was the first time we actually had back up to a basic load and that was on our way out. Wow. What was the, the period for you guys from, from your uh, situation of, of when you finally were able to leave uh, that, that intersection? Like the, what, period, the period of time? No, uh, I mean, what, what happened? Like what was the, the box that needed to be checked for you guys to be able to bail out of We there? had to get the pilots. The pilot bodies were pinned underneath the aircraft. They'd blown through the windshield. And they landed on top of them. And so we couldn't get the bodies out. So we... Once the, the Pakistani, two vehicles made it to our position. The rest stayed about a mile away. They couldn't get into the city. They didn't want to. You know, you don't want to take armor into the city. <laughs> and they, uh, they made it to us, so we used those vehicles to pull the vehicle up while we pulled out the body parts that we could get and load them on top. So that's, that's why we wouldn't leave. We wouldn't leave the bodies behind. Yeah. So once you recover them, you make the mile. Was the mile out treacherous? I mean, were you getting shot at? Yeah, time? all along the way. I mean, I almost got hit by an RPG. A guy in front of me got hit. I mean, I, I literally, from the target house, we went back south and made it. it was going to make a right back east the way we came. And uh, I knew the helicopter was laying there, and I knew they were going to rocket it with an Apache. So as soon as we hit that intersection and turned, I turned because I saw the Apache floating there. You know, and I was like, I'm going to watch this. Like, I want to see what it looks like. And they, they didn't launch him. And all of a sudden, I turned, you know, I waited enough, and I was like, I'm, all right, it's not going to happen. Not while I'm here. And I turn and look, and nobody was on the street. And I'm like, I fucked around. I fucked around. I just took off running. And then a guy jumps out of a, a little inlet along the walls, jumps out and goes in here, and he pushes me in there. And right then an RPG hits the wall as he's coming in, and it kind of fucked his ear up, you know. But it, he hooked me up and saved me from that. But all the way out, there were people firing everywhere. You know, one of the city incidents where you don't know where it's coming from. Yeah. But you get shit will skip off the walls, off the ground. You're like, like I'd love to shoot somebody, but. I don't know where it's coming from. Yeah, you know? and you're down to a mag at that point. Yeah, and I don't want to waste them. Yeah. You know? So it's just it's like I don't know what to do. Yeah. I can't shoot anybody when I can't see them, even if you're getting shot at. So, yeah. uh, so once you finally made it out uh, through that mile, uh, what what happened after that? Did you guys end up going back? Yeah, we, the plan was to go back to the Pakistani Stadium, which was close in town and secure. 
um, all the tanks, all the Bradleys and, and, and the Humvees would go there. At 10th Mountain, had Pakistanis, um, Malaysians there. <laughs> and it was one of those, you guys load up and then Humvee. Okay. And so two Humvees just took off. I don't know where I'm going, man. You know, I'm just, I'm in the back. I'm happy, you know. And we just go and we're just shooting all along the way. And then finally we cross that that line where the good clan and the bad clan, and oh, by the way, don't kill anybody anymore. They're, they they like us. And it's like, okay, so nobody's taking fire. And it's just us two. And every intersection we came up on with the burning tires and shit and people shooting at us, we just kept shooting back. And, I, and they were like, what do we do? I got to just blow through it. Don't stop, man. Don't ever stop. Made it back through the port to the back gate of the airport. And nobody was there but two Humvees. And I sat there for like 30 minutes. And had no radios. The radios were dead. I'm like, nobody's coming. I don't know why. They're all dead. It can't be. You know, I didn't know that they all had gone to the Packy Stadium. And we got lost. I found out last year when I did a post or something of a picture of this Humvee that I sat on. Some 10th Mountain guy wrote me. go, that was my Humvee. And we, we went there because I did a post about, I have no know why I ended up here, you know, blah, blah, blah. He said, we got lost. <laughs> I'm sure. like, oh, good to know. All these years later, we got lost. And uh, he goes, that's why we went. We went what we knew. We went back to the gate we knew. And, uh, but we didn't know where we were going. So we, got, we just did that. Wow. So everybody else um, went to the Packy Stadium and were flown back. And so I was sitting in the hangar waiting. I didn't know what had happened yet. I, I knew when we pulled in, I saw uh, on, on the road, right before I entered our compound, there was like 12 bodies laid out on the streets covered with ponchos and shit. And I saw the boots, and brown, 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 black Adidas salt boots, brown, brown, black Adidas salt boots. I'm like, what the fuck? Those are all bodies, and they're ours. And then we pulled into our compound, and there were Humvees just parked in different angles, full of blood with sand all over the ground where they'd pulled people in all night from the, trying to reach us. And then I realized, you know, how bad the night was, not just for us, but for everybody. And then the, they all started flying back in. All I was doing was reloading my weapon, cleaning it. And then I started hearing about so-and-so's missing, so-and-so's missing. You know, I'm like, fuck, we have people missing? This is like real movie army shit. You know, where I used to say, how do, you, how, do, how do people go missing? How do you have a missing in action guy? You know, I mean, how do you do that? You always account for somebody, right? Left and right. And I realized how easy it is to go missing, you know, um, and not know where anybody is. So did you guys go keep going back in and, and continue to fight after that? They wouldn't let us. Uh, <laughs> That's probably a good idea. Yeah. We were. Um, they brought another squadron over. Yeah, we were decimated, um, but we were ready to go back. We wanted to. And yeah. The command's like, no, you can't. Your, this vengeance is not going to happen for you. You know. Yeah, the black Adidas assault boots were unit guys. Yeah, yeah. You lost two. More, but that's what I saw laying there. Yeah. You know? How many uh, Delta guys total were were there? We're there, mm. and, and in on it. I guess um, maybe forty. Oh wow, maybe. So I mean, uh, that's uh, like an entire squadron was there. Yeah, 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 the whole squadron was there. Yeah, um, and then the Ranger, you know, but um, maybe maybe forty. Yeah, and how, how many total were lost? Eighteen mm. Delta guys. No, no, Del six. Six. Yeah. I think it was. I think it was eighteen total. Yeah. Um, it may seem like a silly question. Um, not bringing any water in, did you not have a, a drop of water that entire time? Out of the pipe that came out of the yeah. wall, man. Flower pots and shit. I was dumping those on iodine tablets everywhere. You know, just here's a couple of iodine tablets. Shake yeah. it and drink that shit, man. It was just, it's disgusting. Yeah. But you know, if you, if you got a night and you think, you know, what if I shit my pants? Who cares? You know, yeah. I'm thirsty. Yeah. It was, it was just that, but it was just dripping. And then I was taking the, the flower pots and shit. What yeah. it was left after pouring them on the couch that caught fire from the RPG, you know, trying to put that fire out. But yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was all out of the pipe in the wall, man. I, yeah. I was I don't know that anybody had water. Yeah. Um, so they wouldn't let you go back and fight. How, how long did you guys, you personally and as a unit stay in country before you came back home? The other squadron stayed a little longer. We went home, Two or three weeks later, at the most. In that two to three week period, what what were you guys doing? Um, training with the other squadron. Like, hey, we'd go out to an old Bannon village or something on the beach, you know, and 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 do hits with them. And it was funny; you could watch, you could see the two different squadrons doing the hit, and you could look over here and like C squadron, you can see shit. Guys were down, crawling up stairs below the walls, and you know, not the bullshit, standing by the wall and looking in the window. And you could look at the other squadron; they're like. Pying off windows and shit like that don't work. That shit yeah. doesn't work anywhere, man. Yeah. 
So you could see the difference of people who had just gotten their asses shot up and people who had, had not had that done with them, yeah. um, even during training right then. But we were passing on as much as we could, um, getting them set up for what they could do, and then we packed up and left. And then they didn't stay much longer after that either. Morale-wise for, for your squadron, were you guys pretty pretty beat up? Man, you know, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure we were. I, you know, it just goes so fast. Um, I know I was sad. I was beat up. A couple of days later on the 6th when Matt Ryerson got killed with the mortar round that landed, you know, right after the memorial ceremony for all the others who were killed and wounded more and killed, uh, well, killed Matt and wounded uh, our commander, Gary. And it was one and a couple other people. I had just walked by that spot when the mortar round hit, you know, and, and it, chunk of it hit me in the leg and, and took a chunk out by my cot and I went running back out there and found my friend was hopping in you know he just got hit on his Achilles and he's like oh, oh, and grabbed me and threw him on a kite he's like avenge me avenge me he's funny um you know and then, but then you could hear uh, our commander screaming and then they moved us all into the bunker along the back because they were still mortaring and you could hear him screaming and I had my hands over my ears I'm like god just fucking stop you know, just stop. That was the most horrible screaming I'd ever heard. And it, yeah, it was just one of those, I'm going to go back. I want to go back out there and fuck everybody up, you know? Um, this is the anger that comes in, you know, when, you, when you've when taken a hit on the chin, you want to you wanna pay it back. You know, because we're America, man. <laughs> Shit doesn't happen, right? Uh, yeah. It was a good learning point for me in reality. What, uh, what, why was your commander screaming? He had gotten the whole back of his body was just blown apart from the, from the mortar round. Wow. And he was laying there just bleeding out and they're trying to keep him alive. And he, he lived. Um, he just died recently. Oh, actually no of, uh, of a tumor, but yeah. Uh, so going home, uh, from all of that, I can only assume that that would, uh, change training and SOPs. And there was, was there a circle the wagon come to Jesus? We need to change some shit and unfuck ourselves. Like, was there any of that? Mm -hmm. Lots of urban warfare changes. Lots of like, what if we get stuck? Well, no more in and out, right? In and out's great. Yeah. But if you don't get out, what are you going to do? You know, back to the regular army basic tactics of how do you dominate an intersection properly versus we'll do it when we get there, you know? No, how do you really do it? So there's a plan. Um, change the way we did mount, you know, urban warfare. We had to relearn a lot again in Iraq. Um, relearn the same messages, but we did a lot of training. And to me, it was one of those, this will never happen again. I'm going to train harder and harder and harder and harder, and that will never happen to me again. And I can't, I think that's another thing that piled on top of me. Um, of I'm not good enough, right? I got to do more. I'm not good enough. I got to do more. And so I'm hearing I'm not good enough, you know? And so I think it just started tanking me, um, towards the end of my career. And then definitely when I got out. Uh, it was one of those, you can't keep that shit from happening, right? No matter what you do, you can't keep it from happening. You can mitigate a little bit, but you can't stop it from happening. I was trying to mitigate and keep it from happening. You know, I, I didn't want it to ever happen again, and then it did again in Iraq you know, yeah. to my, my troop. So, in a sense, to my troop. Between um, Somalia and Afghanistan and Iraq, um, were you just doing training? Did you do a, a, a host of kind of smaller real-world stuff? Yeah, it never ended. If you weren't in Iraq, you were at another chunk of the world doing some other shaping or, or other other missions or training or you had your week off, you know, or whatever that was. Go tell your family you love them and then come on back. It was one of those, uh, you were always training. If you weren't doing the training stateside, which is family time, um, you were doing missions other than combat, which is what we did all the time anyway. But then when you had combat in, okay, now there's combat. So you train up, alert cycle, you're off cycle. Turned into train up cycle, combat cycle, train up cycle. You know, it was just, it was no real off time. Yeah. It, it was always getting ready for the next. Or some officer wanted their, you know, wanted their next star, their next, their next tab or rank. So they would poke around parts of the world. Let's go here. Let's go there. Let's go there. So you're always drumming up missions to figure something out. So there's never any downtime. Were of any of the non-Iraq and Afghanistan things that you were doing, I know a lot of that you can't really get into, but um, were, were any of the things that you were doing super combative or was it all shadowy stuff? Shadowy. Um, kind of intel driven, finding out what's going on. Yeah. 
um, passing it along. I mean, yeah, and then passing it to people who will do take action, you know, um, in, in that part of the world. I'm assuming you can't say anywhere where you were at. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all over, though? Yeah, yeah. Um, all over that, that part of the world, for sure. Um, and then trickle down south a little bit. And then, you know, like Indonesia kind of area. Yeah. yeah. South Pacific. Yeah. Um, once Iraq and Afghanistan, or I guess when, when Afghanistan kicked off, 9-11 in particular, where, where were you at in your career when 9-11 hit? I was a troop sergeant major. No, I was a team sergeant when 9-11 happened. And I was flying over New York, going to Boston with two teams to do training. And wow. uh, I saw the World Trade Center's on fire. I got From my Jeep, a plane. Yeah, I got wow. my GPS smashed against the window. Just, where are we? You know, I'm bored. And I was like, oh, we're over New York. And I'm like, look down. I'm like, look at all that smog, man. It's nasty down there. And you know, I didn't know that it was the World Trade Center's burning. I don't even know if both had been hit at the time. The pilot came on the on the intercom. He's like, "Are there any military people on board?" I'm like, "Fuck! What's he asking that for?" You know, I just figured the guy that boarded us on the plane took our tickets as we boarded in Raleigh. Used to work at the unit and book travel for everybody. Now he's working at the airlines in Raleigh, taking tickets as you board the plane. And I, hey, what's up, man? You know, and I got on the plane. So when I heard the pilot say, "Are there any military people on 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 plane?" I'm like, "Uh, oh, Woody." What'd you do? What'd you say? What'd you, what'd you, you know, you're going to fuck with us or something. So I raised my hand and, and she called me up and I had two teams on the plane with me. Which is how many guys? Um, probably at the time, 10, yeah. 10 maybe. But you're flying calm air mixed in with everybody else. Yep. Yeah. And uh, he pulled me up and he opens the door and he's all haired. Hey, there's, there's been an attack, terrorist attack. The planes have hit this and that. And there's people hijack. I mean, you know, everything. There are hijacks everywhere, you know, and stand here and don't let anybody in. I'm like, what? He shuts the door. I'm like, okay. You know, shit, what does that mean? So I just am standing at the door of the airplane, the cockpit door, like, and I know there's nine other dudes on the plane. I ain't worried about it. Nobody's, everybody on the plane is looking at me like, what's this weirdo doing, you know? He gets on the PA and tells everybody what's going on. That's, that they, seems they like start, a mistake. They, they start tripping. And uh, so I stood there until it landed. And then as we're on the tarmac, the crew's, op the flight attendant's opening the door, like in the Air Force and shit. I'm like, he goes, hey, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want everybody to stay seated except the military on plane. They have to get off. They have a job to do. And I'm like, I dig it, but it's not like I'm getting <laughs> off the plane and going to war. First, got to yeah. figure out who did this shit, right? Yeah. I don't even know what's going on. But if you're going to get me to my rental car and my bag's quicker, I dig that. So yeah. we got off. Um, then we started seeing the TVs, right, and the news. And we got our, got our rental car, and we were heading out. Like, we're going down to Plymouth to do extrication training. We get stuck in the tunnel coming out of the airport, and there's a van in front of us, a flyer van. I go, that's the next thing that's going to fucking blow up, and here we are. Yeah. Was your command not in contact with you, saying, hey, get the fuck back here? No. Um, and once we landed, uh, I called down, like, what's up? Ah, we got to figure out what's going on. I'm like, okay, we're going to just we're gonna keep training. Wow. Well, the other team leader from the other team that was with us, apparently he was calling back every day. Like, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? I'm like, it's not even his team trip. It's my team trip. They tagged along. And we're supposed to leave there to go driving up in uh, um, uh, Connecticut or some shit, you know, BSR. And my boss calls me, CSM calls me. He's like, hey, you guys uh, need to head down to Jersey, Atlantic City. Our planes can't fly any higher than that. And we'll pick you up there at the air marshal place and we'll fly you home. Fuck. All right. So we drive down there after training, catch a flight home. And I get home. I go, why did I come home? He goes, because this motherfucker wouldn't quit calling me. I looked at him like, what the fuck? I go, well, tell you what, tomorrow I'm driving all the way back up to Connecticut and we're going to do our fucking driving training, you know? So we drove up, stopped in Hershey, Pennsylvania, finished the drive the next day and, and continued training. And then when I got home, I'm like, hey, we're going to set up an invasion of Afghanistan and I want you to go out to New Mexico and set it up, our rehearsal. I'm like, yeah, all right, fucking finally mobility i get to do mobility you know this is going to be badass i go out of new mexico open up my suitcase and there's a fucking card in and i'm like oh, open up the card second year you forgot our anniversary don't fucking call me or send flyers i'm like man i fucked up again man. <laughs> two years in a row i guess and that's the time that I, I when i got back home from setting up that trip i told my sergeant major i said man i don't know i don't know i don't know what to do this is the worst time of my life I, i'm getting a divorce probably I, I did this here's the card he's like you're so past, you're so beyond going to training. You've been here so long anyway. You're fucking, you're, you're out of here. I'm like, no, 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 no. He's like, nope, you got to go. So I went, became an instructor for two years. The very first war kicked off. Wow. And then my, 
the first thing I did was after two years, I'm setting up CQB up at a DC. I had to fly to Iraq, do a little tour of Iraq. Cause the second I got back to the squadron, I was taking my troop to Iraq. So I got to go over there and do a little leaders recon kind of, of all the areas, going a couple of hits with the guys and came back, left training, grabbed my troop and went right back over. You know, it was like, here we go. Nonstop. Did that two year instructor break, um, do anything for your marriage? Mm-mm. I mean, it was, no. it was over. Like, was <laughs> it, it over before? I then? fucked up. Yeah, it was over anyway, man. It, yeah. it, you know, it was at the unit or being married. Yeah. You know, and I, I chose the unit. Yeah. I, I literally each time, uh, you know, I'm married now. My fourth, which is last. I, I don't know, I almost did the quotation that you should do on stage. You know, she's my last wife. I'm like, wait a minute, that's wrong, isn't it? Like, it's like, what wife is it? No, it's my last wife. It's my last one because I threw all the others away because I didn't give a shit. It was just this thing that I worked on so hard, you know. When uh, so when that two year period ends, did you get divorced during that time? No, that that stuck around until retirement. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So you go back to the unit. Uh, what is this? Oh three, oh four. Is it early on? Yeah, two years after the war kicked off. So was it oh four? Yeah, I think it was oh three. It was oh three. So you, you're taking your squadron, uh, this is C or D squadron? Uh, C. Okay, so D hadn't stood up yet? No. All right, so C squadron, you're taking them to Iraq. Uh, what was that like f- first going over there? Were, were there a lot of kind of mental reminiscences of Somalia uh, cir- circling back? Going, there was, you know, and watching the news, which is always, it's horrible, it's horrible. Yeah. Everybody's dying and blowing shit up. And you get over and like, oh, that's not as bad as they made it seem, you know. It wasn't anything like Somalia. It was easy. For me, it was easy. Um, I wasn't pinned down. I had all this support. There were regular army people everywhere. If you needed it, there were tanks. I mean, Jesus, there was everything there. Um, Somalia was like, you need what? No, we don't have that here, you know. But Iraq was one of those, you know, the, di- the difference again was I'm in charge now. So it's, it's, it's harder on me because now I'm in charge of more souls. And so it was j- more than just me to worry about. But the first, the first trips to Iraq were, you know, not easy, but easier as a regime, guys, you know, the money people, they're all pussies. They don't give a shit. They just want to live, you know, they want to make money and live. And, and once it switched to foreign fighters and terrorists, it got real dirty, real dirty and nasty. And we had to catch up. We had to catch up with the nastiness to, to, to stay on top. And I think that's where we learned a lot when we were doing hostage rescue techniques of like every, every breach, every entrance I can get into flood it flow as fast you can, you know, shoot at me, not the, not the hostages, you know, and then versus, Oh, there's no hostages in here. I don't have to hurry. Um, I don't need to be in a hurry to get killed. You know, I can just sit outside and make them vote, you know, do a call out. (laughs) You're surrounded, come out. And if they shoot at you, bomb it, you know, who cares? Mm -hmm. So we had to learn that after a couple of heavy losses. What was the the overall um, troop morale with with your guys going over there and and kind of learning the hard way, going from the regime and money guys to the hardened true believers, if you will? Um, did did the unit kind of progressively get nastier, as you say, and and did did the morale reflect that? Like, were you guys ever kind of questioning what the fuck, or or was it all pretty one dimensional that way? I can sum up morale like this. When I first, we first started deploying, I could walk through the squadron bay and look left and right at the open doors and guys were in there prepping their gear, getting ready, talking about tactics, you know, motivated, excited, even though they already knew what they were doing, right? They just getting on the plane, they're practicing, talking, you know, we land, they're ready to go to say fourth or fifth deployment. You walk through the bay, you look in, guys are getting fucking shots, you know, doing shots because... I'm next probably, right? It's a numbers game. They've already lost a bunch of people, you know, a couple from each team or something. And then guys are like just doing shots and cheers and thinking, well, it's a numbers game and we're going back again. Some of them are on their 10th, 11th, 12th, whatever deployments. And it's the morale was up, but I think the feelings were different. Um, the fear was getting higher. Uh, the realization of the reality of the possibility of death is in your face all the time. So it's, it's real versus when you first start. And you could see the guys that had been deploying all along and the new guys that would come in and the motivation. So it's always kind of refreshing, but it's always kind of, you need to hear me out. 
Yeah. It's not like you think, you know, here's what real war is. Yeah. And, uh, it's hard to teach that until you get in it. Yeah. For you personally, um, especially having experienced such heavy shit years before, you know, over a decade earlier, um, did you personally, did you ever get used to it or, or become numb to it? Yeah. Yeah. I think I became, I think I became used to it because like, you, like you get used to anything, you know, like you start out being a doctor and it's gross. You got to cut somebody open or surgeon or something. Like, and then later you're like, oh, whatever, fucking flay them open and throw some guts around and sew them back up. It's no big deal. You know, you kind of learn like parenting, you know, your kid's going to break. Then you realize, oh, they never break. You know, they're <laughs> bouncy and rubbery little fuckers. So <laughs> you kind of realize that, um, you know, it, it, you get used to anything you do. And I learned that watching the news terrified me. Right before I deployed, I'd watch the news and it was horrible. It's just getting worse. And I'd get over and I'm, it's getting better. And I realized, oh, the news is just, they're just selling shit, you know. But it, it was always getting better. But the terror of going over got worse because the news would always amp it up. Intel didn't really, you know, help you with that. But I think you just get used to do, doing the same shit over and over again. The hard part is to make sure you guys don't get used to it. You know, you don't get complacent. Yeah. Kind of like pulling security details around the world. You don't let anybody do it longer than two or three months because they get complacent. So you're going to always have that fresh guy with that fear, that new fear of, oh, it's, everybody's after us, right? And then after about two months, you're like, nobody's after us because nobody's killed me yet, you know? And so you start not doing your job as well. Yeah. That's just a natural human thing, I think. Yeah. Did um, did you spend all of your deployments with uh, Delta Force in, in Iraq? Did you do any Afghanistan deployments? I, I, mm, I did before. I did, uh, I did other countries before the war, Pakistan and things, just as a, a two-team, two-man team thing. Just kind of feeling shit out, seeing who was where, you know, kind of thing. That was a little sketchy. Um, Post 9-11 no afghanistan yeah it was no uh -uh. no i was always bouncing around somewhere else i was stuck mainly in iraq uh, those first two years i was training so and then they gave it to the seals after that yeah like you're over here and you guys are over here like, yeah. oh, okay and then it was like hey maybe you should take some people and swap them and, and work with each other like okay whatever yeah. you guys bored up there <laughs> what, yeah. i mean what are you doing yeah do you know why they they assigned it that way where like seals are afghanistan and and delta is iraq tier one wise mm -mm. Probably whatever the command was at the time. Yeah. You know, I think they fought for different places, and somebody's like, fuck it, you're over here and you're over here, you know? Yeah. And by the way, let's send some of you over here and some of you over there. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason we're going to tell you guys is because they need some help. And the reason we're going to tell them is because they need some help over here. You know, it's yeah. like, really? Yeah. <laughs> what, that, like, back when you were knee-deep in it, what was your impression of, of the Navy guys? No, oh, I loved it. We used to work together all the time. All the time with six guys. We just always train and cross train back and forth. It was fun. It was a friendly thing. War kicks off. It doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. Um, so you, you don't know them as much. So the new guys come in and then the rivalry picks up more versus, oh, he's a bro of mine, you know, versus, oh, let's fuck with him. I don't know him. But I don't hate him, but let's fuck with him. Um, we had guys in Samoa with us, you know. Um, we had guys in Iraq with us on some teams and shit, and I started learning more about SBS, you know, and this and that, and the boat guys. Oh, I'm, you know, we're going to do CQB. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What, what do you guys do? Well, we're the boat guys. Okay, do you do CQB? No, we're gunners. Oh, you're my top gunner then, man. You know, you got to get that whole thing right. You send me two SEALs. I'm like, oh, yeah. Well, he's actually just the boat driver. I'm like, well, that's some shit you should tell me before. Because <laughs> I don't know what y'all do, right? I mean, yeah. You sent me two seals and one of them's the boat driver. You know, I yeah. think there's a different skill set there. So I figured that out. Um, I think the tactics were similar. Um, anything that was too different could easily be worked through, you know, with some training there at the MSS. So Cal I always had a good working relationship with them. Caliber of guys wise, would you say it's pretty, pretty even? Oh, we're way better. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I had to say that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's the same type of people. Yeah. Want to get shit done. They're not afraid of shit. I mean, they're afraid of shit, but they're going to yeah. do it anyway, right? I yeah. mean, fucking people say, I'm not afraid or lying. Yeah. I'm afraid, but yeah. fuck y'all. I'm going to do it anyway. Those, those are real people. Yeah. And that's what I saw in the same, same guys. Yeah. Um, how many deployments did you do to Iraq? I don't know. Yeah, yeah fuck time. I don't know. Oh, uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. I could sit here for an hour yeah. and try to count, but I'd, I'd be yeah. wrong still. Um, I don't know. I don't know. So <laughs> an, an, an even more ridiculous question. Do you have any idea how many operations you went on? Thousands. Thousands. Uh, yeah. I mean, sometimes we do five a night. 
and I'd count I'd count those five because each time is a, is a death chance. Every night, literally. I mean, I found out just last year also, um, sitting around Christmas one time, and I'm bored, and I think, oh, my guys are bored, man. Fucking Christmas sucks over here, you know? Like, who wants to do a hit? Let's go do a hit. And they're like, yeah, go do a hit. And I found out, like, last year talking to one of the guys, like, we don't want to fucking do that. We wanted a day off. I'm like, I thought you guys wanted to go. You know, you learn shit about yourself down the road that nobody would ever tell you at the time. Yeah. I got to the point where I just wanted to keep moving. Man, just to kill the time. I hated laying on my bunk. I hated planning for a mission. I'd rather just go do the mission. You know, go do the mission. And so, the, you know, that, the assaulter life goes by quick. But when you move up, now you're a team leader. Now you're a troop sergeant major. Oh, now you're a squadron sergeant major. You're not doing shit. You're watching everybody do the shit that you came to do. Mm-hmm. And so it's just one of those jobs of, I got to get out of here. You know, I got to get going. Yeah. I got to get moving. Uh, during your time there, um, were there, so I guess, in that natural progression, I mean, did you do multiple deployments where you were still kicking doors or was a lot of your time in Iraq more managerial? I mean, I hate to use the word managerial, but I don't, I don't know what else you'd call it. It kind of is. I would go on every hit as a troop sergeant major. I would go on every hit, and I would be right behind the last team guy in the door. And my job to me was, one, talk to people, you know, find out what's going on on the target. Two was to take detainees away from the assaulters so they could keep going. And I would use my support guys with me, you know, you know you got EOD, whatever, whatever you guys are with you. You have a team of three, you know, and another team of three with a commander. And I would go in right behind them, all right, scoop up all the detainees, cuff them and shit, and then keep them all together and then search the house. And I'd keep track of where everybody was and move them around the, the target area if it was multiple houses and stuff. And then I would start, once all secure, I would start just um, chatting with the guys we just detained and trying to figure out what was going on. Yeah. That meant another hit down the street or up the way or, or, you know, the next night. I don't know. But yeah, but I would be really close behind them, but I wouldn't kick in doors. I was calling in, like, put the charges on the door. I'd do the countdown, and they'd go in. You know, I'd be standing there peeing because I'm so nervous, peeing on the door, doing the countdown, and zip up and go <laughs> in because I always had to pee, man, you know. And it was one of those things, the nervousness of it. It was like, oh, I'm doing the countdown, peeing on the road, and go in, you know, and zipping my pants up sometimes because they get yeah. they get itchy and go fast yeah um the i, I know it's probably all a, a blur and hard to even uh, recall a lot of the stuff but do do any operations that you went on stand out as being exceptionally memorable in a good way or either uh, you know halloween night ramadi we did a, a combined hit with a with black and um, it was one of those things where the intel changed on infill. We were standing there talking to the regular army unit who was telling us about that area, and they would go in and circle the area for us. Black would do this section, we would do this section. And during that time, we missed a change in intel. So we got in, and, and uh, the Brits parked in front of the target building, thinking this was a target building. So they parked in front of the target building full of bad guys who were all inside like oh shit like shh you know these are normal brits or soft brits the soft brits and so those brits hit these four or five houses this way my troop hits these five or ten houses this way and i work my way back up you know we got the bradleys and the tanks out there and and the brits are like we're done we're clean we're heading back to our vehicles and and they they called in we're going to hit this one last house in front of our vehicles as soon as they opened that gate, RPK fire opened up. Killed the first dude instantly, wounded the second guy, kicked it all off, man. They were they were loaded in black black pajamas and shit and ready to go. They were launching RPGs and shooting, and it was like, fuck, you know? And it just erupted into chaos. We crashed on the way in, too. I forgot that. We crashed our vehicles into each other on the way in because they missed a turn. So my, my Humvee slammed in the back of the Humvee in front of us because they locked up the brakes. The guys went flying into the next vehicle and shit. I'm like, God, this is not a way to start. So we're taking big fire. We're trying to, the Bradleys are trying to knock down the stone wall. The Brits' vehicles are in front, so we can't really shoot at anything yet. So once we get the Brits to move their vehicles and get their body, bodies out of the way, then they start picking that wall apart. Then they start calling in rockets and shit. I'm like, we're right across the street, man. I don't know if rockets, you know, the higher ups, like, do you guys want some, some high Mars or some shit? I'm like, wait, wait what? A high Mars? I don't think so. What is that? Well, it's a rocket. We'll shoot. I go, where are you going to shoot that from? I like Fallujah or some shit. And I go, no, because <laughs> I don't trust that right now. I'm across the street. Yeah. So they brought in little birds and they started rocketing it. And I mean, they, the Bradleys and shit tore that house up and then it was time to go in. 
and there were still dudes. You know, there was a light blinking in the stairwell, and there was a guy that we shot that was pushing the garage door remote, trying to make it go off, but it had been disconnected due to the, you know, the, the, the munitions hitting the building. Guys had flown over the back and right into the arms of the Brits who killed them all, you know, and it was just one of those things like, man, how did you get that many people in the house? You know, it was crazy. Yeah. And, and still survive all that. Yeah. And there was still dudes alive after rocking that house, in that house even. Guys went to the house next door, climbed up over the wall, and shot dudes on the roof still. You know, I've seen so many things of bombing people with 500 pounders and they get up and walk away. I'm like, I don't, I don't, none of that shit's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> none of that shit works all the time. Yeah. Wow. Um, any, any other operations that, uh, that are, are ones that, that come to mind? There was one that almost happened. It was, uh, our boss was like, we need to go into Fallujah. I'm like, nobody's going into Fallujah, man. It's surrounded by Marines. 82nd fucked it up. The Marines had to come in and surround it. They've dug in. They're everywhere. We've been watching them, you know, for like months after months of them digging in prayer circles, you know, bombing a prayer circle and shit like that. He's like, we need to go in. I go, we're terrifying them already. He goes, no, boots on the ground. I go, boots on the ground? They don't give a shit about it. 500-pound bomb, they don't know where it's coming from? That's terrifying. Because we need to go. What are you afraid? Cowardice? And I'm like, motherfucker, <laughs> don't. Don't fucking say that. You know? So it was one of those, well, I want to go down and ride the route line. I want to drive the rabbit, the, you know, the rabbit line where they're fucking, or the rat line where they're resupplying everybody, hit Fallujah, turn right, shoot at some people, and then make our way back. And I go, in what? In our vehicles? Yeah. The ones that get blown up on that rat line all the time? Yeah. The regular army goes down there, and they have hundreds of dudes. We have 15 dudes what do you want to do you can mr toad's wild ride you want to just go and shoot fuckers and camp out and shoot fuckers and camp out and then come home that's not what we're designed to do we didn't do it but it was a struggle and it was one of those where the word cowardice came out and it, it fucking did not go well yeah you know? um, it wasn't cowardice it was common sense yeah no i mean we we ran into a couple of situations like that similarly where we had had some uh chats with our bosses about what you know and it's weird the it sounds like you probably run into the same thing uh even at that level where there there's some guys where you gotta fucking beg to work and other guys where you're like are you fucking stupid <laughs> you know and it's like how is there that big of a of a contrast yeah. you know uh, like some guys won't let you they're scared that anybody's gonna fucking stub a toe and they won't let you do shit yeah and there's other guys who are like dude did you think about any of this before you thought this up dude, like, that's somewhere between the stains you got to pull back and the mules you got to whip that's where yeah. i want to be you know yeah. stains are great but they go crazy sometimes you, yeah. you don't want to follow them man yeah. you know? like, you're running <laughs> off to get killed and i'm not in a hurry for that i've been there you know yeah. simply the guys haven't been there yeah like you walk into a room who wants to get in a firefight anybody raise their hand i pick everyone else yeah you know because yeah. they've been to one they don't want to go back you yeah know? yeah one of the uh, questions I ask most guys that, that have pretty heavy combat experience is um, at any point when you were over there, uh, when you first got there or prior to going, did any of your leadership kind of sit you down and, and give you the, the no shit, this is why we're here, this is what we're trying to accomplish, or was it all very compartmentalized? If they knew, they didn't tell me. That, I mean, to me, that, that's the same answer everybody gives. Yeah. Like e Even for a guy like you at, at that level, for there to be that level of disconnect is fucking mind-boggling to me. I quit calling them, you know, by their names. Next. Next. It doesn't matter who the fuck they are. They're going to put somebody else in there, right? You kill our, well, not today, but whatever. You take out our president, right? I mean, basically, he's not here anyway. But if we had a president and you took him out, they'd put another one there. It doesn't change what you and I are doing today or the gas station down the street. I don't give a fuck, you know? And so the idea of, oh, Saddam, oh, this guy, oh, that guy, fuck, they're just going to put another dude there, you know? So it was one of those, you don't get talked to about it. Um, it's up to you to determine why you're there, if you want to be there. But I think it's looked at like my job. Who, who do you need me to kill? Who do you need me to remove? Who do you need me to capture? It's almost the excitement of getting to do it. Like dogs, you know, on a hunt or something. You yeah. Let them go and they just go. They just hunt. They don't think why. They don't care why. That's just what they've been trained to do. And um, I've learned since in my life. I've looked back and questioned a lot of things that I've done and why I did them and what authorities and what reasons. And then, then I also have gotten to the point of looking at it like, well, the bad guys think they're good too. They think their way is the right way too, right? Mm -hmm. So who's the bad guy? 
<laughs> us or them, you know, are we all bad and are we all good? I mean, it's just uh, government versus government and the people that get pawned around are the ones that get to do it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've similarly, as I've gotten older, have looked back on, you know, when I'm in my early 20s running around Iraq, you know, waving the flag, thinking I'm doing the right thing. And, and I'm not saying that I wasn't. I think anybody that, you know, kind of to your point that, that serves, you know, volunteers and, and Rogers up, up to and including their life, you know, payable to the, to the U.S. government in whatever the way the U.S. government sees fit. It's not for us to determine whether or not it's right or wrong. It's just, you know, we're doing the best of our, the best to the best of our ability with, with the best that we have. And, you know, I think there's something extremely noble in that, but there's also a, a level of naivete that exists that, that can be dangerous also, you know, um, because Crazy. Cause the reality of it is, you know, if, if China, which I mean, fuck, they're, they're building some shit in Cuba, right? Or they're about to, we're not happy about that. If the Soviet Union had it, or you know, I guess the Soviets, maybe not the better example. If, if China had a fucking carrier battle group 15 miles off the coast of San Diego just hanging out, we wouldn't be cool with that. No. Well, maybe. I don't know. Maybe now. <laughs> maybe. Maybe now we would. <laughs> I would say historically we would. Yeah. Uh, or if, you know, Russia decided they were going to have a fucking training base in Tijuana, you know, like we'd be like, the fuck you are, you know, or if China decided, you know, what, we're, we're this whole like Christian based democracy thing you guys haven't have going on doesn't really serve us so we're going to come give you a buddhist based you know, communist government because that that's what you guys need yeah you and i would be mass gunmen running around the streets fighting them that, that's the reality of it you know so yeah that's for sure that's why i tell jen all the time she's like what, what do you think of this what do you think of that and i go listen if they're not my front yard it's not time to kill them yet yeah. I, I, what can you do right now? Yeah. That's what I think that's where people are. What can I do? The yeah. frustration that's building of I can't do anything. Yeah. Uh, who's like, going to so stop? You, know, worrying you can about do it. whatever you want and the DOJ won't do anything to you. So where, what am I going to do? Yeah. You know, that's that teetering point of, you know, is it a revolution? Do you have enough people? Because if you start one, there's not enough people, it's going to be over. And, yeah, and then, then everybody's like, oh, I'm not starting a revolution because I end up like those guys. You know, it's, it's one of those. When do our leaders decide that um, they have enough, or when do we decide we're being pushed too far? Yeah, you know, backed into a corner. Anybody's gonna get tired of this shit. Yeah, is that something you think about, like kind of from a a personal constitution or red line standpoint, where you have a this is my fucking no go go no go criteria of like it's time to do something? Is that something you think about? I think about it a lot, but I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what my go button is. My go button is my family right now. My go button is I'll protect my family, but I know that's too late. Yeah. If I'm at my house defending it, nah, fuck, it's too late, right? But what else can I get going right now? You know, give me a, a fucking militia going and shit. People look at that and they start fucking focus on you pretty hard. Then uh, I don't know. You know, like my my naive days where the U.S. government we're the winners and I'm going to do whatever I can to do what the good government wants us to do. And then, you know, you grow up and you're like, good government. It's just a government. Yeah. Just humans like me who might have become greedy or you know and they want to maintain their powerful position they'll do anything to do that anything mm -hmm. lie cheat steal anything yeah and then then they can't go back and admit it right so they got to stick with that the rest of their life and oh keep going and get worse and worse i'm like man i don't know if, if a group called me up go would you join you know I'm, i'll be like huh, what i don't know man are you recording this i mean you know you don't trust anybody nowadays right that's the big deal is we have a lack of trust of, of government or yeah. people or who's what's truth yeah are the ufos out there are there aliens is it the government is it what's true who knows yeah, yeah it, it is it's increasingly difficult to know especially with um technology being what it is with deep fakes and ai and and you know computer generated shit it's like fuck i don't even know what's real anymore i walked up the other day i saw a dodge truck doing a wheelie and then shot off a cliff and i went oh that fucking idiot yeah and then i saw another dodge truck do a wheelie and take off and i go look at this fuck i go why who makes a car this fast yeah my stepson leans over and goes oh that's a video game but she down there said like a fuck you yeah, <laughs> but anyway, I, go, I knew that i was just trying to show her that yeah no, you can't it. tell yeah i know it, it's, it's harder and harder to tell that shit um, all the time that, you know, as you sit here now looking back and reflecting on your entire career, do you have any regrets? That's a tough one. You know, I used to answer that. Fuck no. I do it all again and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, man, again, as I mature and I get older, it's confusing 
Do I have regrets? Yeah, I've got some regrets. Um, one of the ones I won't talk about, but um, I'll deal with those on my own. But the, are they? I guess do you have any? Are those personal regrets? Do those you, are personal regrets. Um, do you have any professional regrets? Like, do you look back, especially like you know, you and I both served in Iraq. When I look back and think why we went there, and and you know, d- does that change? why I joined and, and why I did what I did. No, it doesn't. You know, do I think that we should have gone equally? I would say no, you know, it, it, it's hard to, for me to rationalize what we lost as a, as a society in that country for what we got out of it and, and why we went there. Yeah. Uh, I would ask you the same question. Me too. I regret that because the more you deal with the people, the more I dealt with the Iraqi people, you know, even if it was just, I'm looking for somebody. So I'm going to sit down in your home and have a conversation with you. The friendliness, the kindness. Um, I have, I have Muslim Arab friends all over the world now that I, that I still talk to and hang out with. I lived in Jordan for two years. I, you know, before it was oh, Muslims are crazy and you know, you got to kill them all. They're crazy. And it, not all of them, but you know, it was one of those, the reasoning, it was a reason. It was an excuse, you know, de, you know, de, demonize the enemy in whatever ways. But when you get to know the people, we're all the same, man. We're all really the same, just trying to get by. We want to be happy. Now, there's there's zealots out there, right? We have zealots, right? Christianity didn't have any zealots, did they? You know, we, we didn't have crusades or anything. So we've done our part. Um, but my regret is that I didn't take a more open-minded approach to what I was doing versus you told me to do it, I'm going to do it, and that, that gives me the okay, right? I mean, I use that as the okay. And now I look back and I thought, man, I should have thought about that harder. You know, I probably would have shortened my career a lot, but I'd have been smarter for it, right? Mm-hmm. Making more intelligent decisions. Yeah. But I wasn't that smart back then. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't as, as mature back then. Oh, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? Right. Um, as you got closer and closer career-wise to getting out, and actually, I guess before I ask that, I know it's somewhat limited and we may even need to edit this out, but... Uh, can you talk at all about any of the use of dogs just with what I do for a living in your time in Iraq using dogs? Is, is there any cool dog stories you can share? You know, when we first were introduced to dogs, we were in Israel training with them. And when we went over there, we were like, well, they fucking pussies. You know, you have fucking dogs. We used to make jokes. If you're, if you're scared, get a dog. You know, like, what's wrong with you? Just go in and shoot the fuckers, you know? And, and then seeing what those dogs did, you know, we had a big guy, Joe, would go over there and Two dogs were hanging off Joe's arms. He's a big muscular. He's like, what? These dogs are hanging off his arms. He's like, yeah, he's slinging them around and shit. I'm like, dogs suck. You know, dogs are stupid. They get in the way. You know, I'm trying to do a hit on a train. And there's a dog in my way, and I got to lift his hind legs up and throw him onto the steps. And now he's in front of me, and I can't go down. You know, I can't do my job. I'm like, these dogs are stupid. To where everything a dog can do, man. You know, everything dogs do for us nowadays is ridiculous. To suiting them up, jumping with them, to cameras everything i mean think about it. anything you do with a human you can do with a dog yeah but they're better their smells better you know their sense is better people are afraid of dogs even though they don't have a gun they're terrified of that yeah. thing teeth coming at you man well, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a primal and very unnatural act getting bitten by a, by a da- dog it's fucking terrible i used to yell at our handlers when i was in charge of them for a few few years i'm like i'd have to go talk to them i go i think some of you fuckers would throw yourselves in front of your dogs to save their life yeah I go, they're flashbangs on a leash, man. Fucking, I'll buy you another one. But you yeah. can't tell a dog owner that, man, or a yeah. dog handler that. You know, you, you don't even own the fucking dog. You know, and of course, when they retire, they want that dog. You know, I was like, yeah. got to decommission that dog or yeah. sign that paperwork. I'm like, I can't. But they they saved so many lives. And they still save so many lives. Um, Is there one, one instance in particular where they saved some of your guys that you could share? Yeah, just uh, send, let's say you send a dog in to clear a house for you first, you know, with the camera, going room to room to room to room. And then, you know, pops his head into a closet with a curtain in front of it, and there's a dude, and blows up, you know? And it's one of those, wow, would have all been in there, you know? Guys would have been in there. Dogs, dogs that have grabbed people out of the scruff, you know, the fucking underbrush and shit, when the squirters take off, and you send the dog out there on a long leash, and you would have never seen that guy, you know? Yeah. Laying there waiting to shoot you. You start shooting at the dog and you're like, oh, and you can drop him, you know, right then. Yeah. Amazing. It's amazing what they can do. Smell, bite, see, you know, pick up on. Yeah. I mean, when your dog can tell you have diabetes. Yeah. 
or COVID or whatever they're figuring out now, you know, using dogs to sniff for other things in airports and like bombs and drugs, sure, but everything now. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, I mean, bed bugs, cell phones, currency, it's, fucking human remains. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. I mean, that, I mean, one of the most interesting or to me kind of fascinating capabilities they have is, is their odor discrimination. And that's what makes them so good. I mean, you can talk stats of how many times more powerful a dog's nose is than a human's, which doesn't really, I mean, it's hard to, to rationalize a yeah. hundred times more powerful. Well, what the fuck does that mean? Well, what that means is that like, if you and I walk into pizza hut, we smell fucking pizza. A dog smells every single ingredient that's on that pizza. I was going to say yeah. that I was going to, I heard that if you yeah. smell lasagna, a dog yeah. smells noodles, tomatoes, Everything. pepper, oregano. I'm like, damn, the way yeah. they break it down. Yeah. yeah. I Same. mean, even the ingredients that, you know, that's in the flour that, that makes the pasta, you know, like they, they can break it down, you know, even, even that far, you know, but, uh, why can't we do that? We should be looking I, into how to take that it. from the dog and put yeah, it into, I know. <laughs> yeah. get it, get a GMO human yep. being that can smell something. Like that. Something. Um, all right, so countless deployments in Iraq, tons of tons of experience. Um, as you were nearing the end of your career, what was kind of the transitional point for you when you decided, okay, I've done my time, it's time to get out? Was there a catalyst? Was it gradual? How, how did that shake out? Is that quick? Really? Yeah, starting up D-Squadron. I'd been doing it for a year, year and a half, getting ready, getting ready to go full, you know, and deploy. And I was I was deployed as the IZCSM before that for three months, and this was May, more I don't know, fucking summer, I don't know. I got a call from a from the from the rear saying, you know, you missed a physical, you need to take a physical, you've been, you know, you haven't done shit. And I'm like, I haven't done anything. I've been deployed, man. Fucking. So I ended up taking a physical, deployed again, and got a call from a doc saying your your cholesterol is zero i go oh, that's good right <laughs> fucking no cholesterol is <laughs> good right? right and he goes no it's indicative of steroid use i'm like okay sorry uh, no what, what are you talking about and so i ended up going months later i ended up going home forgot all about it you know going home and um docs call me in again yeah um it's indicative of steroid use i go oh, steroid use man what the fuck are you talking about i had but i wasn't it had been a while. And I'd, I'd had like three or four surgeries already from my neck being fucked up to my lower back being fucked up. Um, and I had bought some shit online that I was using to try to work out and get better. Online. I, bought, I didn't think about it. And so that one of the docs is my friend asked me, well, they say you're using steroids, but I'm trying to figure this out. Did you take anything? And I go, I took this thing off the line. He Googled it. He goes, well, that would make you look like this, you know? And I went, okay, well, fine. Tell him. And the other doc who didn't like me said, well, that's what, bodybuilders use when they're coming off of steroids I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about so he recommended that i get removed and sergeant major's out of town at the time so my d squadron commander at the time called me on the phone he said, yeah, i need to come talk to you and i go what's up because i need to talk to you about this and then i went okay you don't need to come talk to me at seven at night bro you can just tell me on the phone you don't have to waste your time no i think i should come over i go don't fucking come over <laughs> No, I need to come over. I, I should talk to you. I go, I know what you're going to say. You don't need to fucking come over. Don't put yourself through that. I'm good. I mean, I'm, I'm turning fucking red, right? Hangs up the phone. He's on his way over. I looked at my wife at the time. I go, I need a Xanax, man. I'm fucking freaking out. Took a Xanax, chilled a little bit, and he came over. He's like, hey, just due to this and that, we're going to have to relieve you as squadron command. Uh, sorry, Major. I went, okay. See you. Thanks. And he left, and then... Uh, a couple of days later, the CSM of the unit came home. He goes, what the fuck? He freaked out. He didn't know. It had already happened. Um, he goes, an officer talked to you? And I go, yeah, mine. He goes, that never fucking happened. He was freaked out. Anyway, I didn't lose rank. I didn't lose pay. I didn't lose anything. Nothing happened to me other than I'm no longer squadron CSM. Go, what do you want to do? What do you want to do in the unit? I go, well, how about CDD then? I'll be the SAR Major CDD. Which is what? Uh, combat development, okay. whatever. Just testing shit, you know. It's just it's it's where guys go when they want to chill or they're getting ready to retire. And I said, well, we can't really give you another leadership position due to the embarrassment of the command. If we did, why'd we remove you? It looks stupid. And I went, oh, fuck me then, right? Fuck me. And so I went to Range 37. Uh, General Sakalik at the time wanted to bring back the connection with SF and the unit and training and teaching because a lot of dudes going through our 
OTC were failing CQB because they were doing it differently over there. So we went back and like, I started teaching how we did it. And I go, wait, they took that on. So the failings were less down the road, which was good for us. But that was my last two years in the Army was I was still at the unit, but I never went there. I just went to Range 37 down the street, which was fucking better. So much better. I forgot the camaraderie of a team of SF dudes versus individuals on the team trying to outdo each other. The team. Yeah. The fucking bros, man. You know I mean? And the unit's good, but it's competitive. It's very, very competitive. You lose that bro shit because we're bros until I need to be better than you. Then fuck you. You know, I mean, that's the way it is. Where SF was like, man, I go, this feels like a family again. I, I just started relaxing a little bit more. Um, so it was devastating for me, but I got to hide from it for two years. It was embarrassing shame to go back. And then when I was retiring, I was like, I'm out. See ya. And one of the old, uh, one of my old officers who I'd put through OTC as an instructor said, you need to retire here. Do it in the old C, he was a C squadron commander. And I, he goes, do it in C squadron where you started. And I go, I'm not fucking doing it. I'm out of here. He goes, do it, man. Come on, come on, come on. So they talked me into doing a retirement thing. So there I am standing in front of the C squadron and people from the unit showed up. I got General Miller on a VTC from Afghanistan talking about, you know, all the things we've done together since Somalia and what a great guy I am. And they hand me some fucking award that I had six of them already. And I was like, oh, fuck, I threw that in the fucking corner. Didn't get a Legion of Merit. Didn't get anything else like everybody else. I didn't get unit colors. And nobody could tell me why. What, what are unit colors? Uh, the flag that, you know, that they, they pull up that they used to put on the guide on for all regular oh, right. army units. But that flag that, that represents that unit, you know, it says Delta and blah, 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 blah. You put it, put it on a plaque and, and hang it on the wall. And it's like the colors, you know, colors and they number them. I didn't get that. Nobody could really tell me why. And so when I left that day, got in a limo driving out to Southern Pines for a party. I mean, halfway out, halfway to Southern Pines. I was like, stop, pull over. And fucking jump out and throw up. And I was like, you drunk already? I go, I haven't drank in a week yet, man. I was devastated. Devastated. And I spent years thinking I'm the only one. Like, my shit. I'm a shit bag. I'm a fucking piece of shit. I got fucking let go. Nobody, I didn't get colors. I didn't get this or that. Everybody I talk to that's out now. Like, oh, I got fired for that. I got fucked for that. I hate, hate, hate this and that, you know? And I'm like, damn, nothing good ends well or it would never end, you know? Everybody has a story about how horrible it was when they left. Most, most people yeah. have a horrible story. But it was, uh, you know, I'm not PNG'd. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> I'm still working on it. But, I mean, I, I go, I've gone back. I've gone to formals and shit, you know, when I can stomach it and things like that. But, um... It's a it's a place that wrecks people, man. Yeah, it, it wrecks people. Yeah, I mean, it. I was never at development group, but it, it. There's a lot of similarities. It sounds like there. You know, I would say the parallel is is exact in terms of the regular SEAL teams is very bro like, and yeah. yes, there's competition, but it's friendly. It's right. healthy. It's bragging You're rights. Not trying to it's, fuck each other yeah, over. Man. Yeah, it's. Tying a dude's running shoes together during a swim, run, swim, run when, yeah, he, when he's yeah. in the water to fuck what with blow you know. boat Zodiac in his team room, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but, uh, but hearing a, a lot of stories about it, it's so competitive at that damn neck that, yeah, it almost, not almost, it is counterproductive. Again, I'm, I'm not speaking from experience, but I've heard many white side seals say I've had friends go over. And they won't talk to me. anymore. Oh yeah. I, I, I did have that happen yeah. for sure. Guys that I was at team three with that, fucking totally cool go there and it's like one in particular I, we ran into him in Bahrain and I'm not trying to sound like a whiny bitch but to me it's just it's, it's reflective of of the shift is that you know ran into him I was like oh hey what's up and then I said his first name and and he literally just gave me like the bro nod and turned around didn't shake my hand didn't say anything I was just like are you fucking kidding me like I run into you in, in the middle of fucking Bahrain of all places like haven't seen you in four years everybody's and, a super spook yeah, and I was just like fucking Christ <laughs> I can't talk to you anymore I'm a super spook yeah I was like, just like shut man, up whatever uh, so much secret shit going on in the world man nobody cares yeah yeah but during your uh the, the actual retirement did you get that feeling of like Almost you, you can feel the way people are looking at you, like thinking a certain way, or, or was it? I felt that way. They, nobody yeah. was. Nobody knew the story that I knew, right? I just looked over at the table of awards, and I noticed There's there, weren't, there weren't awards that everybody gets. Like, yeah. I should have gotten these awards seven years ago. I spent 20 years in this one place. Yeah. 
you give that to people who were here for four. Yeah. I mean, 20. Let's just remove the last two. 18 years in this place, I never fucked up. Yeah. And you still, you were wrong about me fucking up, but you still won't give me that shit? They don't give them out anymore, but it was, it was too, I asked why, and it was always oh, too dr- drama-filled. And I'm like, of course, the personalities, man, a bunch yeah. of A-types trying to fuck each other over. Great place. I love it. And there'll be people that hate me for saying any shit, but that's fucking true. Yeah. If they sit down and think about it long enough after getting well, yeah, being away from it long enough and stop relying on those, the training that they learned in that place to make a living, and that's all they have, then they can admit, oh yeah, it fucked me up. It yeah. fucks everybody up. It's yeah. a hard job to do, and it, you can't keep a family very well while doing it. Yeah. Uh, in terms of upper echelon leadership, there, can you talk about how that's broken down? Like, is there a commanding officer of the entire gig the same way there is on the on the Navy side? And yep, commander, officer, all the way down, unit, squadron. Support elements, they all have a, a senior enlisted and an officer. And in my opinion of this, and that's how it's worked for me and others, in the unit, basically, the officers come in, administrative. They give you that stamp you need when you want to do something. But the good ones shut up and listen to the SAR major that's been there for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, most of them get the speech. I've given the speech, if you shut up, I'll give you a star. Right? If you fucking try to tell us how to do shit, you won't even fucking make that. Yeah. You know, you won't be here that long. The ones that listen get their star, they move on, and it's great. The ones that don't want to tell you how to do shit and change what you're doing, they they go away pretty quick. Yeah. Were there uh, times after certain gigs or any high profile missions that you were a part of where like the president came and, and met you guys? Did you have any of those kind of fucking movie like moments? I missed. I missed the one where President Bush came to Fort Bragg. Shook everybody's hand. I was in D.C. training. Missed all that. Um, I, I got to talk to President Bush on Thanksgiving in Iraq when we were doing security for him, and I was in charge of the detail. And he was getting ready to go out and start serving food and talk to everybody, you know, the regular Army dudes at, at Biop there. And we're behind stage. And he was just like, well... How's everything going? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, so I'm like, never talk to the president, right? And he's, like, and he's like, well, how's everything going? Yeah. I'm like, well, hopefully, you know, hopefully by Christmas we'll have set on for you, sir. Well, that'd be real nice, you know. <laughs> well, I better go out and talk to these boys. And he left, and the Secret Service leans over. He goes, "Did you just promise the president you'd have set on by Christmas?" I go, "I don't think so." Yeah. He goes, "You said it." Like I wouldn't promise, yeah. you know. Fuck. We we got him before yeah. Christmas, but um, were you in on that? Can yeah. You talk- no shit. Yeah. How was that? Boring. Really? Fucking boring, man. You know, we did a hit in Baghdad the night before. And it was one of those hits where, hey, his enabler is in town. I'm like, fuck again? Yeah, okay. Let's go hit this fucking target. The agency was trying to tell us it was stupid. We're like, oh, okay, well, we're chasing this fucking line of, 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 of people. So I went and did the hit. It was at the end of a cul-de-sac. Rolled on in. And as, as we were rolling in, I noticed a dude from that house area and i didn't see him come out but walking like you know armored vehicles are rolling up man i'm gonna check it out right he's not checking it out and i just happened to see that and he walked in and went into another house and i'm like okay maybe i don't know you know so we took the house down there's nothing there we start to, and you know once i'm getting ready to wrap up and getting ready to leave we start taking fire from a, a field way off in the other direction i'm like nobody shoots at these armed, nobody shoots at us they know you can hear it on radio don't shoot it these guys are crazy Shooting at us. I'm like, why are they shooting at us from over here? I said, well, fuck it. While we're dealing with this, I sent a team down to go check out that house. I said, it's like three down. It's got a black gate. They went down there, worked their way in, and found the dude, flipped up a mattress, and he had a toy AK-47, just a plastic one. And they could have dropped him and didn't. Grabbed him, brought him back, threw him in a vehicle, took him back. I didn't even talk to him. I, 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 normally, I talk to people. I didn't even talk to him. Threw him in the helicopter, flew him to Balad, and like I went to bed. Hours later, like, hey, hey, wake up, man. We got a, we got a Saddam hit. I go, fuck again, you know? No, no, seriously, this one's good. I go, you say that every time. No, so wake up your man. I go, I'm not waking shit up. I got up and I went and started looking at what they had, looking at what he was saying, listening to transcripts. All right, go get the team leaders. You know, bring the team leaders in and start talking. All right, go wake your boys up. We're going to the crit. You know, fuck. Loaded everything up, drove to the crit. Um, there were two targets. The fish camp off in the end of a, of a field. And then one in the middle of a town where his cook was. I'm like, fuck. 
we're going to get the cook, aren't we? Because that's not my area. My area was Baghdad and West. C1's area was to crit and whatever up in that. So they got to pick and they picked the fish camp. I got the cook's house. We, you know, met with a regular army there who got credit for it and shit. Rolled on in and um, blew the doors open, ran in. There were babies everywhere. There was a cook and there was, you know, cleared it, nothing. Freezer full of fish. It was full of fucking fish. And I'm asking this dude, oh, where's Saddam? You know, through the turf, where's Saddam? Where's Saddam? And all of a sudden he starts having a heart attack. Uh, and I get the medic over there. I go, keep that fucker alive. He knows where Saddam is. And I'm like, I'll tape him to the front of the vehicle and he can point where the <laughs> fuck we're going. We're going. I'm on the radio calling my boss like, hey, hey, we're going to roll in. This guy's going to point out where Saddam is. He goes, negative, return to base. I'm like, no, you don't understand. This guy's fucking, he's going to point it out. He's faking this shit. There's fish everywhere. We're Negative, return to base. I'm like, you fucking asshole, right? Load up, pack up, return to base. The boss is like, my sergeant major, you know, like, come on over. I go walking over. He opens up the door and I walk in and he's fucking sitting fucking beard got a leaf in it and shit and i go him that's him i go that's him because that's why i told you to return to base man i go fuck he looks like dirty uncle fester I man he spit <laughs> on me right then i'm like motherfucker no shit saddam spit on you yeah he's dead though so. <laughs> <laughs> fuck him <laughs> right that fuck guy. that dude yeah yeah it was one of those man i wanted to clock the shit out of him you know but i figured i'd go to jail for something stupid you yeah. know so did you uh, interact with him at all, or just he spit on you? Yeah, he bit? spit on me. I, I just looked at him. I go, that's all right. You'll be dead soon. Yeah. And I fucking turned and walked out. Yeah. And then they packed him up, and we walked him out through the rest of us and threw him on a helicopter and never saw him again until they hung him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the fish thing, was he, is that all he ate or something? He loves fish, and that's why he lived in a fish camp, and his cook would cook fish and shit, some kind yeah. of fish freak. Huh. Maybe because that's all he could give without you know, people knowing what they were buying food for or something, but yeah. Wow. Man, that's fucking, that's crazy. Fucking Saddam Hussein spit in your face. <laughs> little fucker. Did, uh, did that moment, I guess, impact you at all? Like big picture wise of thinking like why we were there and, you know, it took a while to find him. And like, was there any closure or any, like, was it a moment for you or were you just like, yeah, fucking whatever. Tomorrow's a new day. And man, I was so happy and motivated. And then we loaded up in our, vehicle to go back to Baghdad, which is a couple hour drive, you know? And I'm sitting back there with a sergeant major and uh, just chilling. Everybody else is passed out and sleeping, and he's just smiling. He's just fucking smiling. I don't see him smile much at all. I'm like, what are you so happy about? And he goes, I don't have a retention issue anymore. <laughs> and I went, what the fuck? He goes, everybody was so tired, and we finally caught this dude. I go, but what about tomorrow? He goes, fuck that. We got the day, man. Yeah. And he didn't have a retention issue. And, you know, the next day, wake up, going on a hit to go catch next. Yeah. Whoever the fuck it is, man. Yeah. There's, it never ended. You think when you catch the dude, oh, I'm going to kill Bin Laden in it. It's yeah. fucking too late anyway, man. You know, you catch Saddam. You, yeah. you, like I said, you are president. We're not stopping. It doesn't yeah. stop you. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a victory of sorts, but it doesn't yeah. stop anything. It's a, a notch in the belt, really. I mean, because yeah. it's not like World War II where it's like Hitler is the, the head of the snake. That As soon as you kill him, hopefully everybody's like, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. That dude was crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's a trip. Um, deck of cards, high value target wise, were, were there any other notable characters that you guys managed to, to nab? There was a blacklist of people that they didn't publish that we went after a shit ton of those guys. Um, most of the deck of cards we grabbed. Mm hmm. And then off of that sprung different leadership that chased us down rat holes for years to come of people I'll never forget, like Eminem. Called him Eminem, Muhammad Nuri Mutar. <laughs> Fucking chase that dude forever. I don't know. He might be dead. I don't know. Never knew, you know, go chasing after him and kill a bunch of people. You don't know if you caught the dude or not, you know, and then yeah. you don't hear from him for a while. And then maybe he pops up and you chase him again and you never hear from him again. Like, did we kill him? I just leave notes everywhere, you know. I mean, I'm and Mary pictures of him working for the U.S. and drop him on targets like, whoops, yeah. secret stamps on it. And just, oops, sorry. Yeah. Maybe, they, maybe they killed him. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Were there any uh, um, big shifts or, or notable Al-Qaeda guys that were on a different level that you guys managed to get a hold of? And, and I guess from from your perspective as a, war, a high-level warfighter there, did you notice a huge difference between the the local 
even if they were Saddam Fedayeen guys or, or high-level Iraqi guys, between them and the hardline Al-Qaeda or foreign guys, like, was it very obvious, the difference? It's so obvious. They had nothing to lose. You know, when you're fighting for money is one thing, and the guy that pays your bills is gone, okay, you know, yeah. fuck that then, right? But when you're based, your motivation is religious, or that's all you know your life, or, oh, your family will die if you don't do what I need you to do, you know? Those guys didn't always get a good break. Yeah, I want to go help the, 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 the war. You know, I want to help drive out the Christians, you know. Okay, take your passport and your clothes and give you some track suits and, and an AK and tell you to go fucking kill people until you die or, or we'll kill your family. They're pretty vicious. Yeah, You know, they don't want to die. They want to go home, but they can't, so fuck it. And it's like they're all backed into a corner. And they're, and they're you know, well-equipped. Not well-equipped, but they're equipped with enough that they need. That they were more vicious. The other guys would give up. The guys that were trained in, in combat and war and shit. I mean, they're oh, hands up. All right, you win. You know, it's just a game we play, right? Until you lose. But those guys, that's all they want. They want your head. I don't fucking care. Did you run into or or ever find yourself uh, really surprised by the the soundness of the tactical nature of any of the guys you fought? Did you ever run into groups you're like, holy fuck, these guys know what they're doing? No, they learned a lot. They watched us and learned. You know, they would set up explosives along the walls. No one was stacked up along the walls. We had to change that shit. They would wire houses to explode and put cell phones in the houses that they knew you were after. And then they'd watch you from a distance, enter the house, and you'd see a cell phone or no one else. You had to figure it out. Oh, get out now, right? And, and then, boom, house, we had houses blown down on, on people. And then right after they got out, too. I've seen videos of guys in the house. Hey, dogs bark. And you, caps and, you know, caves in on them. And then you hear people fucking, oh, that's it. That's fucking it. I'm done. You know, yeah. the helicopter crashing now. There's, and just the voices. Yeah. And funny, it was no, none, of it, none of our guys got killed on that one, you know, oh. except the suicide bomber and, and, you know, the baby in the house. Yeah. Did you guys, have, did any of the missions that you went on in particular just go fucking horribly wrong? Yeah, a couple. Um, you know, the, the Halloween night one went pretty pretty wrong. Um, we did another one down south when they said it was a wedding party. It looked like a wedding party. <laughs> Fucking wedding party. Um, we hit that. It was it was drawing the rat line. As soon as we were in filling, they shot an RPG at the first helo and hit it as they were as they were pulling out. And that thing had to crash land across the field, which means I had to send all the rangers to secure it, which means I didn't have any security. You know, I had three teams chasing probably 15 squirters that had spread all over. And now my, my, my headquarters team is landing in a field with a guy running right at us, you know, like fucking taking off and stopping and turning, looking. And I'm like creeping up like, oh, I'm going to smoke this dude, man. You know, like he didn't even know I'm here. And he turns around, he's like, watch me. He didn't have a gun. I'm like, fuck. And then I couldn't really shoot him because there were rangers behind him. But he took off running back into the target because they had blankets and all their weapons. And all I could yell was, we have a squirter going into the target, into the target. So everybody on the roof was like focusing. The dude was covered in lasers. He reached down. That was it. That was all he, was all he wrote. But I ended up running out of water, right? Didn't have a QRF because they were too far away. Tanks and Bradleys, they weren't going to make it in a long time. Hilo got shot down. I'm the one calling in Black Hawk down this time. I'm like, fuck me. Here I am again. How many years later? And that went on for about six hours. And they were like, well, I'm like, I'm going to blow the helo in place. We're going to get out of here. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're sending in a dart team. I go, what's that? <laughs> it's a downed aircraft rescue team. And I go, oh, what's that mean? You know, we're going to fly in parts and a, and a test pilot to fly that thing out. That takes hours. So I had to wait for that. And we were under fire the whole time. Um, couldn't use AC-130 because my guys were spread out and I'd lost accountability of one. So once I got everybody back in and I couldn't find the one, I sent the team out to find him, and they found that guy um, in a field talking to a cow. I was like, okay, he must be dehydrated. Let's get him in here. And I, I, and I had a dude that got blown up with a suicide bomber in the room next to me. Um, they were chasing him in the room, and then they shot him, and he blew himself up in that room. So I had a guy that was fucked up really bad in that room that needed to go out. But I couldn't bring in the medevac because we were taking fire from everywhere. I couldn't suppress it because I had that guy missing. So once I had that guy back in, once I found him, I suppressed all the fire with AC-130 and then got the medevac in and out and then found a huge cache of IEDs in the driveway that were, you know, waiting to go off. So we finally got the helicopter out of there. We finally exfilled, you know, the next morning and got back and then bombed the shit out of that house because it had all the explosives around it, you know. It was crazy the way it blew up when we hit it. But, yeah. 
Yeah, that was a long night. That uh, a lot of things happened. Yeah, of of all the time that you spent after um, Somalia, it, it still overwhelmingly trumps everything else that you've done in terms of going through some gnarly shit. Yeah, I can talk about Iraq all day. I don't get emotional. It's one of those things, you know. You when you ask me about Somalia, I haven't thought about it. And then as soon as I think of it, I'm like, I got to get a hold of myself because yeah. it's just an it's an emotional period in my life. I don't think I'll ever not be emotional. Yeah, as hard of I, as hard of I as I've tried, um, the second I get real and think about it, man, it hits hard. Yeah. Um, I was curious that you mentioned running uh, some of the selection as a, as a cadre. At what point in your career did, did that take place? Very early. Um, all the operators run selection. So whatever, whatever squadron's up for the next selection date and whatever troops up in that squadron. So mm-hmm. it rotates through squadrons and through troops. So when I got there, it was um, C3's turn, the snipers, and, and they didn't have enough people. So they grabbed me because I'm the new guy. So I went pretty young. Yeah. Um, and that's when I started working out because I was working with the snipers up there and Paul Howes, one of the guys, he was shooting pool and he like grabbed my arm. Hey, there's a string hanging off your shirt. <laughs> oh, that's your arm. And I was like, <laughs> fuck off. You know, so I, I quit running um, and I started eating Joe Weider weight gain, you yeah. know, dog food bag size. And yeah, and it started working out. And I, I finally gained 100 pounds over oh, about wow. 10 years. And I was, I was like 250, I think, when I met wow. Jen, which it wasn't all muscle. <laughs> it was a lot of muscle, but... I had given up at that point too. And, and all I remember is thinking when I was 250, like, I wish I was 150 again. Yeah. You know? And it's taken me 10 years. Yeah. I broke, I broke 200 the other day and I was like oh, fucking nice. ecstatic. And yeah. I've been staring at the scales like, all right, I'm still hovering around 198. I'm, <laughs> I, I might be good now, you yeah. know? And uh, I didn't realize, you know, nobody, hey, you're fat, right? Nobody tells you that. They tell you, hey, you're looking really good, man, yeah. better than you did. I go, what do you mean? I was fat earlier? Yeah. Like, no, no, I, yeah, you do. Yeah, you just okay. <laughs> I thought that too, but nobody likes to say that shit. But yeah, like, oh, you look really fit now. And I'm like, I just quit eating and yeah. quit working out it so much and yeah, follow a different lifestyle plan, you yeah. know, lack of stress plan. Yeah, no shit. Uh, did you work with Pat McNamara at all while you were there? Like, did you guys work? As an with? instructor, yeah. he was uh, another squadron guy and he came over as one of the instructors the same time I was over. And we actually deployed to Iraq together. When I went over as an instructor before I took a troop, hmm. he came over as well. Yeah. Um, and we, I mean, we didn't run a really round together, but yeah. we were there for a short time. And then I have—I didn't work with him other than that. Yeah. Um, I didn't really know him in the unit. It was one of those, I don't know that dude. He seems crazy. He's always doing crazy shit. He must be crazy. You know, and then I get to know him now, and I'm like, that's a fucking nice dude yeah. doing things for the good, right reasons, you know. And yeah. people might look at him, oh, that's crazy dude like I did. I didn't know him. Yeah. The more I get to know, I'm like, man, he does some nice shit for yeah. people. Yeah. Um, so the, the way that you got out was, uh, was tough on you. Um, once you got out, what did you do immediately afterwards? Man, I, I thought I need a job. Yeah. Right? Like the day I got out, I'm like, man, I need a job now. Like it didn't hit me until the next day. Like I need a fucking job, man. This shit ain't gonna last. And I hit some friends up, man. I got, I got a call from a buddy who had been out for years. Um, he said, hey, there's a slot in Jordan running ranges or, you know, managing a range or whatever at Casadic, King Abdullah Special Operations Training Center. I thought, fuck yeah. What's it pay? You know, I said, what's it pay? And then fuck yeah. Um, and I left 10 days later uh, before Christmas. And I spent Christmas. I mean, yeah. my wife now is finally retirement, you know, at the time. And I'm like, eh, see ya. But I'm going to make more money. Oh, yeah. Get the hell out of here then, right? Yeah. Merry Christmas. So I went on over there and, and uh, spent four months over there and then they asked me to start up another program not just being a range guy but to start a separate program and train a hundred jordanian soldiers to be special forces qualified and by the way you need to hire a team so i had to hire 10 sf dudes and i ran those guys come up with a four uh was it a four month plan on how to train these dudes from zero I, you know bedouin can't swim i don't wear shoes to to fucking i can swim and wear shoes <laughs> And I'm special forces qualified, right? <laughs> and uh, I'd do that and then go home for a Well, I'd go home for two weeks. Everybody else would go home right away. I'd close out the paperwork and shit and, you know, certificates. And then I'd go home for two weeks. And then I'd come back for two weeks and prepare. And then the cadre would come back in and we'd start back up another four-month course. And did that for a bit until the money dried up. And 
And then other generals came in and brought their people in and got rid of me. And then I came home and that's when everything went to shit, you know, because I'm like, well, I really have nothing to do. I spent a year and a half in Jordan. And now I'm back to what do I do now? So I just slept all day and watched TV all night, you know, and like uh, I just became a, a train wreck of, I don't know, I'll just go out and make money every now and then do contract work. Where were you living at the time? Uh, North Carolina, Fort Bragg. And I was just, I was tanking, you know, reclusing and tanking. I was literally divorced, living in a spare bedroom in my house. Um, we never talked. It was just, I was a disgusting person anyway, you know, I didn't give a shit about anything or anybody. Were you drinking or using Oh, yeah, I was or? drinking for sure, man. I probably couldn't wait till I was drinking again, you know, just so I could pass out and go to sleep and kill time without yeah. thinking of things, you know. Continued that for a bit, man, and then I started working more. Um, and then started doing more contract work, and then and then met Jen, and then started up, co-founded a, a company with her and two other guys to train special operations people, and did that for a, a long while until people started dying again, you know. Um, I was used to it. I expected it, even in training, you know, and mostly Navy SEALs. And Green Berets is who is who we we did um, training for, and it was right before they deployed. So we would give them all the realistic military training stuff, you know, and cities like Miami or Charleston and things like that, and set up all these targets for them. And Jen couldn't handle it. She's like, "Man, these guys are dying in training. I get to know them." And then the next iteration, the team comes back, and there's like two or three people missing that I got to know because they're dead. Or she's like, I, "I need to do something different. I need to. I don't want to help them go to war anymore," you know. Because she didn't know anything about the military before that. Didn't know shit. And all of a sudden, she got to look up under the fucking curtain, man, and see underneath the skirts and of what everybody does, and then got a real big grasp of it. And, and all the people she talked to, and every time you're on target for hours waiting on the hit to go down, it's always, hey, Jen. You know, hey, Jen. I'm like, oh, they like you because you're cute, right? It's like, but they would sit down and tell them about her, their wives, their kids, their problems, their issues. And she would share some stuff with them. They're like, man this is really cool. And they would start getting a little bit better and have a different understanding. So she's like, I can't train them to go to war anymore. I have to train them to come home. So I'm going to, I'm going to, so I'm going to go start a nonprofit to help these guys. And hopefully we'll start with you, <laughs> you know? So I just kept making money for a few, uh, a year and a half while she figured out how to start up a nonprofit. And that's when we started all secure was just, was mostly for me up front like you need to do this you need to do that you need to try this try this just throwing things at me because we had no idea nobody knew you know and whatever stuck whatever worked we would video it and then put it out and it finally started the foundation in 17 and just it's been nonstop since of getting people to wow what's working for you you know if you see somebody getting big and you want to get big you're like hey what are you doing you know yeah hey tom's smiling I've never seen his fucking teeth before, man, you know? So what's happening? And then the the curiosity brings him in, you know? And then we've got four coaches right now that are nonstop on the phone. We run retreats for people. Um, got a big one coming up at Fort Bragg in October for 150 people. And it's all just through the nonprofit to help these guys realize that, you know, you can come home. It's going to, it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot of work to decommission yourself, man. And, and, ease back into society that you'd rather punch everyone in the face, but you can't, I mean, it sounds good, but you can't do it. You know, you gotta, you gotta reintegrate back into society, back into your relationship and learn all the shit you're doing. Doesn't work out here, man. It, yeah. it saved your life. Then I'm thankful for what I did then. I don't need those tools out here now. And yeah. so teaching guys not to use those tools on your spouse and your, your, your coworkers or your boss or some shit or somebody at Walmart or driving down the road and you want to run them off the road or shoot them. That's not the rules here. That's incredible. The, uh, I mean, so I mean, it's almost kind of the uh, the hair club for men. You're not just the president. You're you're a customer. Right? I'm a big customer. I literally, I mean, I do hyperbaric um, every day that I can now. Um, but you, I mean, you guinea pigged yourself on on all this stuff. So I mean, to me, like there there's no better owner of a group like that or or founder, whatever you want to call it, is somebody who has tried all of the things, has been through all of the things that can that can speak to these guys, not just from a respect standpoint that they know that you, you know, like you're not just some fucking scientist in a lab coat, tell, yeah. you know, waxing poetic on what you think is going to work. You're like, motherfucker, you know, if there's anybody to listen to, it's you. Um, but I think it's also awesome that 
you know, you, you tried everything. Is, is, is there a, like a curriculum or a protocol, like a, a pipeline process that you put guys through if they reach out and say, Hey, I want to come be a part of the program. Like, how does that work? Yeah. It was through a lot of through, through a lot of what we learned with me. Like we started off with anger management, you know, I, I fucking went to anger management. I think the doc was a former doc for Eric Clapton or some shit, you know? And I thought, I thought, man, I'm just angry all the time. I need anger management. When you stop screaming at fucking people and they embarrass me or scare me or make fun of me or whatever the reason is that triggers me, you know, it's all the same. It goes to rage. And after talking to him for like a week, he, he, he was one of those guys that like, listen, you don't have an anger management problem. You have post-traumatic stress. You don't, you're not an alcoholic. You have binge drinking issues, you know? So think of this, think of this, think of this, and think of this. And I'm like, well, that's fucking easy, man. And so just like military, my military way, I did those things, you know, and everybody started noticing a difference that went to like transcendental meditation. Jen's like, let's try transcendental meditation. Go, what the fuck is that, man? And I went into this guy. He's like, we're going to, oh, we're going to sit there and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, fuck you. I don't believe it. And I close my eyes. I'm like, I don't even believe this yeah. quacky shit. And what then, am I, Dr. Strange? Yeah. 20 yeah. minutes later, I'm like, what happened? <laughs> yeah. How, how long has it been? You know, and I felt great and that started to work, but I wasn't quite ready for that foo-foo shit yet i needed some more ball bats to my head right that was too smooth for me um so we figured out the pattern you know they went to tms and things like that so now when when guys call guys or gals call and they're like hey everything's fucked up you know i kind of listen to them for a bit me or jenna listen to them for a bit and figure out okay what is it you're hiding what is it your story I, the stories are all the same yeah the lies are all the same the excuses are all the same can you give me uh, an example of of the, the most common line of bullshit or that you can, something that somebody says that you can see right through. I don't have post-traumatic stress. I'm like, Oh, okay. You know, you scream at your kids, you scream at your wife, you're drunk as fuck every night and you hate humans. Where'd you learn all that? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't hate, I don't do that. I don't, oh, you don't know that you do that then, you know, why don't you ask your wife or your friends how you are? Cause it's the awareness that we don't realize we're doing it. Or I used to argue, well, then you're just a fucking pussy. Well, you're talking too rough. Oh, well, you're too fucking sensitive. Why don't you fix your fucking self? You know, like there was no wrong that I could do. It was just everything that I did was, was right and for a reason. But I didn't realize the reason was to stay alive. I didn't realize that no one's trying to kill me in the room in, in Target somewhere, you know, in St. Louis. And so I learned that the awareness of it first, and that's, that's years of being aware of it and then admitting it. And then getting to work on what that problem is. And that's years of changing that muscle memory that we've developed. So we tell guys, you don't need help. You need training. You need training on how to be in a relationship. You need training on how to be in a, in a world where you're not at combat. You know, and you need to train yourself on how to live a normal, calm life versus, you know, living in the red all the time. You don't need help. Nobody helped you shoot your gun. They trained you how to shoot your weapon. You know, they didn't help you do CQB. They trained you. So we're going to train you on the things you've never been trained for, how to come home from war. And it's not that bad. It's not, you know, you hear, you hear therapy and it goes, oh, no, I'm good, man. I'm real good. Yeah, you're fit as a fucking fiddle, right? Most guys, you know, are probably fit as a fucking fiddle, right? Yeah. It's, it's, so we don't call it therapy. We don't call it post-traumatic stress. It's whatever we call it, post-traumatic stress or injury. Because disorder turns people off and, and everything else that, that turns people away from it, we try to rebrand it and bring them in, you know? Yeah. To just reduce or... Um dismiss the kind of stigma that's associated with all you, that you have to i've been in arguments with doctors it's absolutely a disorder the book says this and this and this i said but if i can't get him to come see you it doesn't fucking matter yeah so you call it what you want when it gets in here you're gonna fall on your sword for that shit because that's what you learned in college i get it but i'm telling you what gets him in the door you cannot call it a disorder just stop at the s yeah. it's the same thing for you man and then he doesn't feel so shitty and then he might stay around long enough because you're yeah. dealing with a whole new breed of people here yeah um, have you messed with the, uh, the, like the brain center magnet cognitive, uh, treatment stuff? And also have you done any of the ayahuasca DMT five, whatever the fuck? I don't know. I've not done it. I've, I've done everything. Yeah. I, uh, I've done transcranial magnetic stimulation. That was about three months every day, five days a week. Did you notice hour? a huge difference with that? I slept and I slept. Um, I calmed down a little bit. Anger went away a bit. My depression went away a little bit. Now it's not a proof for post-traumatic stress, but it really helped me, right? And the, you have post-traumatic stress. So what? What is it in post-traumatic stress that's making your life shitty? Your rage? Your lack of sleep? 
there's so much more, right? So I, I knocked out two of them with that one. Um, we did, uh, Jen, Jen and I do everything together, which she can do. We did the five MEO DMT. Oh my God. That was the worst thing I'd ever done in my fucking life. Yeah. And the best thing I'd ever done in my life. For your experience, it, it seems like everybody has a similar, but nuanced, different experience. Um, did you experience the, uh, kind of watching your entire life, like a movie and seeing things from your childhood that you didn't remember? Like, did you experience any of that? No, I was terrified. I, uh, I remember standing. Did, did you experience any of that? No. No. Um, they told us that's more typical of like ayahuasca. Oh, okay. Is to have more lucid kind of. We went to 5MEO, which is like the hard the shit. Yeah. Varsity squad. We Here's. We really see anything, yeah. but we, I mean, we did. Yeah. I, I saw some shit, but it wasn't my family. She saw our family, like coming to kill her, you know, oh, um, wow. her ancestors. I saw. I saw darkness and I knew what it was. And I saw this, I don't know, wall. It was like cellophane, right? And this wall coming at me between me and the darkness. And I'm, I don't remember this, but I, she told me, I was saying, fuck, fuck, fuck. And I put my head down, fuck it. And when I put my head down, I said, fuck it. What I was doing was leaning into that cellophane thing that was starting to encompass me. And I just leaned into it and pushed. It was like it was sucking my air away. And when I pushed through it, and I came through, that's when I started throwing up, right? You know, in real life, I started throwing up and I thought it was so much. And in my mind, I had these devil's feet coming out of my mouth, like chicken feet. And I'm like, start spitting in a bowl. And I was like, laid back down, like, oh, another hit. I'm like, fuck. You know, and it just kept happening and happening. And it was one of those, you're dying. You know, you're dying. Um, and I remember the doctor saying, don't fight it. Let go. It's your ego. Don't fucking fight it. And I fought it for a little bit, and it was horrible. And when I, when I signed, I said, fuck it, you know, fuck it. And I let go. It just, it opened up. And I tell you, the ending for me was I think I was laying there crying and laughing at the same time and pointing to my wife in the room, telling her how much I loved her, even though I didn't know where she was in the room. She's like, you pointed right at me. I'm like, oh, fucking no. I had a thing over my face, and I was tripping out. Um, and I was so happy. And my intention when I went in, I remember they said, have an intention. I was like, fuck, I don't know, man. Uh, joy. I want, I want to feel joy. I, haven't, I woke up and I felt so much joy. I don't, I'd never felt that happy that I remember. And that lasted for about four months with me. I think it wasn't as so good right up front. But then you started, Jen started noticing differences in how my behavior was. And it was one of the things she said was the best treatment that I'd ever done that lasted the longest. That was the shortest amount of effort put into it. Yeah. So it, it uh, I've heard that from other people that it has kind of a shelf life where it'll start to kind of wear off. And, and people will go and do it, and then that's it. I'm done. Yeah. Uh, that's not it, man. you got to keep going. Behavioral change. Things like that, the SGB, the still a ganglion block, or the dual sympathetic reset, you know, if you do both sides, that helped me too. But you'll hear guys say, I did it, and I got, I've got had 10 of them. What did you do in between? Nothing. Well, that puts you in a space where you can calm down. Now you have to go get to work on behavioral change because your behavior is what's fucking people up. They don't yeah. like how you act. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. You're always raging. You're fucking rude to people. You're always aggressive. You know, you look big and mean. I'm like, you know, fuck you pussies, right? No, but <laughs> that's what we do and we don't realize it. So becoming aware of that, you know, was the big thing. Yeah. And just letting that go. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Um, would you, so would you say the... Um, I already forgot the term, the uh, the drug trip down in Mexico, if you want to call it that. The 5-MEO? Yeah, that that was the, the most impactful treatment that you've done? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm doing hyperbaric since? now. There's nothing outstanding other than I'm sleeping better. I'm snoring. I'm like, oh, I'm obviously sleeping good. My memory's getting a little better. I've done the SGB. We're looking at ketamine, you know, here back and forth on ketamine now. We're looking at ayahuasca for sure. She's actually going to become an integration coach because so many people are doing it now. Have you gone back down and done it again? Since? No, we want to. It's like a time thing now. Yeah. The things we tell people, your life's worth everything. Don't make time the issue. And we're like, well, we don't have time. Yeah. And it's like, shit, here we are. Yeah. Got to pay the bills. And that's, you know, that's the reality of life. I've yeah. had people tell me, if you don't fucking go get help now and quit everything, go get help, you're fucking up. Like, I have a family to raise, man. I yeah. still have to pay the bills. Yeah. You know, so those guys that have told me that, you know, they're fucking living with their family now because they can't quite afford everything. It's like, you have to do it within your the realm of reality. Yeah. I can't just pack up and go away for six months, you know, and, and get better. Yeah. 
I got to do it within the family and, um, and the time that I have and, and, and the job that I have as well. So, sure. and, and we typically do everything like we're going to go do ayahuasca when we can, um, just so we can talk about it. We would video everything we do and put it online to hopefully take that stigma away from people or the fear. Yeah. I've had, I'm not getting a shot in my brain. Okay, good. It's in your neck. <laughs> good. You won't, you won't get one in your eyeball. It's in your neck and it resets your, you know, your nerve, your vagus nerve. It's like getting a cold plunge. Yeah. You got to get the vagus nerve out there. Yeah. No, this, they shoot, um, Nova, Novocaine, whatever numbing agent calms it down. It's like taking a dry erase board and re erasing it. Yeah. All that trauma is gone. Now, if you go back to trauma, it's back on again, get another shot. But if you don't, you can continue to work on it. What, uh, what is that shot called? Stellet ganglion block, SGB. Give me a shot. It's for free. I get you for free. Oh, no shit. <laughs> Travel included. Do you, is it not able to be done here in the States or you can't? Oh, yeah, you can yeah. do it. Um, they have different centers. They might have one down here, but the one I went to is in Chicago, but they have multiple centers around. But you can get it anywhere now, pretty much. Okay. Yeah, that's that's uh, remarkable. Man, what a fascinating journey you've had. Um, I needed it. Yeah. I needed it to to reset, to unfuck myself, man. Yeah. I was fighting everything, you know. Yeah. And I see so many people fighting everything, you know. They're just fighting, giving in. Yeah, like there's guys that won't go to AA because they say surrender. Yeah, like man, change the word, bro. Yeah, <laughs> surrender. You know what it means, man. Yeah, give into the process, the plan, the fact that you're, you know, that's your demon. Give into that. Surrender to that. Yeah, and then let it go. Yeah, I mean, to me, the ultimately, it's about just becoming a, a better version of yourself, you know, yeah. and and whatever it takes to become that. Why would you fight that, right? You know, and and I agree. Like I, I'm as guilty of it as anybody of being, especially when my kids were young. I mean, they're older now, and and even speaking with them and reflecting on when they were young, you know, I grew up in the SEAL teams from 18 to 30, and as soon as I got, you know, I got out when they were babies started my own business, you know, was trying to run my own business and, and raise two kids. And, and I was harder on them than I should have been plain and simple. I was, you know, and, uh, you know, having, having conversations with them now as, as older teenagers and, uh, you know, admittedly, I've also, I've worked hard on myself as, as far as my relationships with, with them go, uh, as well as, um, you know, really, you know, trying to, to learn from, uh, if you want to call them mistakes, if you want to call them, you know, not, not going about it the right way, whatever, like I've, I've constantly tried to improve and, and they recognize that, which is, is for sure, uh, fulfilling and rewarding. Uh, but it's interesting, you know, there's a lot of parallels between raising dogs and, and children, especially the younger they are, the, the more paralleled it is, the older they get, the, the less it, so that it is. But, um, <clears throat> it's the eye of the beholder thing yeah. is that, you know, it's like, what I think is right for, for, for raising a dog. Like if they don't understand what I'm trying to accomplish, it doesn't fucking matter what I know or think same thing with a kid. Like you may not think you're being an asshole. You may not think you're being overbearing. You may not think you're scaring the shit out of them or that they have any reason to be deathly terrified of you. But unfortunately they may be death, deathly fucking terrified of you. And, and if that's the case, you're fucking wrong, you know, and, and you've got to figure out how to, how to fix that and navigate it. And that that's been, you know, something I've worked very, very hard on and, and, and I'm, um, proud of, of how far I've come with that, but fuck, it's, it's been a path for sure, you know, and, uh, yeah. and, and one that, uh, you know, I, I feel fortunate that they're, they're willing to, to share some of the things that, uh, that they experienced from their perspective growing up to, to help me along that path. It's been, uh, it's been tough, but rewarding for sure. But, uh, Dog, dogs yeah. helped me with that. Um, yeah realizing you know dogs pick up on that dominance yeah. presence we have three they're untrained yeah but when i'm mad yeah they know they're laying down they're chilling and when she says something to me and jen says something to me and that whatever and i change that dog will sit right up oh yeah and he leans over close to yeah. her i'm like i'm like i look at him like, oh baxter and i realize now oh yeah okay i'm gonna take yeah. them are them and their horses man yeah no dogs are a mirror of of their owners in in so many ways and and to that point you know, it's one thing I, I run my head into the wall with trying to explain to people from a dog training standpoint. If you think about, you know, in the last several hours that we've been talking, we've exchanged a shitload of information, right? How much has body language, tone, inflection, how, how much has that played in it? Very little. You know, yes, it, it's played a role, but it's insignificant. Right. Now you think about a dog. Well, dogs don't even fucking think in a language, right? So 
language, you know, is very, very little to them. You know, it's, it, for them, the, the adage of it's not what you say, it's how you said it. There's nothing more, more poignant than that. And, and so if, if you kind of always think of it that way, is it like dogs don't think in a language, they don't dream in a language, they don't reason through problem solving in a language, everything with them is a plus B equals C. It's a simple association. Yeah. And so your, your body language and, and your, your tone, your inflection, your emotion, your intent, they pick up on those things enormously, you know? And, and so, yeah, I mean, to your point, you know, dogs are, are a good indicator of, of how you're behaving, you know, cause if you, if you have a close bond with a dog and you start to f- fucking lose it and go down that path, they're going to, they're going to reflect that really quick, you know, but yeah. And I've noticed it more in the dogs than I would notice it in my wife. Yeah. My wife's good at it now. She, yeah. She'll duke me out, man. Yeah. She'll fucking go toe to toe, man. I don't fuck around with her anymore. Yeah. But the dogs, as soon as I get mad, yeah, I, I notice them. Yeah. And that brings it back to me, yeah. you know, and I'm like, oh, and I go give him a hug and he's like, mm, yeah. I don't know. And I'm <laughs> like, like, motherfucker, just give me a minute, dog. Yeah. Give me a minute. Man. It's yeah. going to take me a while. Yeah. But yeah, I really, I'm really appreciate with dogs yeah. and they try to show us that with horses too. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, amazing stuff, man. Uh, so f- where can people find you guys and, and help and, and either get involved or go through your process? Uh, what, what's the best way to do that? Yeah. Everything is at all securefoundation.org. I mean, if you need a coach, there's a button, request a coach. You want to go to Camp Homefront, which is one of our, our retreats, click that, you know. You need general information, click that. You know, you want to donate, click that. You want to buy a book or a shirt or whatever, you know, the, the, the whole Gucci gear, whatever, just click the button. Everything's pretty easy. We're on all social medias as well as all secure. Um, and everything goes to Jen and I, and then we, we can hand you straight off to the coaches or whatever you might need. Or if you just want to, people ask general questions all the time. I'm always jumping in and answering them, you know, if they're, they're decent questions or my son's going to selection. You know, what should I tell him? I fucking never quit. quit. Yeah. yeah. Never fucking quit. Yeah. And, and what else? I, I can tell you some shit, but yeah. you still got to go through it. Just yeah. don't fucking quit and you'll make it. I mean, that's the thing. Well, that's not true, but yeah. Yeah, your chances are greater of making it, yeah. but for sure you won't make it if you quit. <laughs> yeah. So. so yeah, anybody can find us there at all secure. Um, and the biggest thing I think we need is, is we always need money. Obviously yeah. I hate to ask for fucking money, but, Always need money to help because we're now, like I said, we're on our fourth coach and we don't want anybody to wait longer than like three to five days yeah. to talk to our counselor for the first time. Cause everybody's saying, I got a six month wait here, or four yeah. month wait there. I'm like, you, you hit a coach button. You're going to have a coach hit you back that day and find out a day that you're available to talk. Yeah. And it's that, it's that important. And then from there we'll get you to either SGB, ketamine, psychedelics, um, God, whatever else they have out there, we've we found other organizations that we've partnered with and we know aren't fucking people over. Yeah. And we send them there to get whatever they need. But we only do that for special operations. Any capacity, yeah. any branch. Yeah. Awesome. Uh anything that I didn't ask you that I should have or that you want to talk about and uh, and bring up favorite color. <laughs> I don't I wouldn't know it, right? It probably it's probably changed. I, I don't know. Clear. People ask me, What's your favorite color? Like blue. What's your favorite color? Red. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. I've never thought of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, no, I think we covered a lot. Um, shit, just, you know, just the fact that guy, I want guys and gals to know that you don't need to sit out there and think you have to hide something or I don't want to miss something, you know, because war fucks you up. It's not, it's not a sport, you know. It's a lifestyle, and it, and it fucks us all up you know, in one way or another. And that's not all relegated to just warriors. You know, post-traumatic stress isn't just for warriors. You know, you can watch TV and get post-traumatic stress. You can get in a car wreck and get it, right? So how bad you have it determines how long it's going to take. But yeah. starting, man, guys just need to start. Yeah. The guys that, the ones that kill themselves, they don't reach out, they don't ask, they don't say shit. There's not much you can do other than be there for them when they decide to do something. Yeah. Right? But the ones that open up, those are the easy ones. The ones that reach out, those are easy. Because it's not that big of a deal. It's not that hard of a process to slowly, because it's not going to happen overnight. I'm still fucking with it, you know. And yeah. so I got I retired in 2010, so yeah, I'm still playing with that. And it's been seven, six straight years for me. Wow, of hard like what now? What now, honey? What what can I do now? To to I would say that the spouses to be patient. Yeah, because every time I get a little better early on jen be like now let's go try this and i'm like okay a little better let's go try this and i'm like wait a minute i'm never fucking getting better and you're always going to want me to do something else right so that story starts to tell you something as well you know we're very intuitive and in tune to what stories people are pushing our way yeah you know in the special ops world so we start telling ourselves oh she wants me 
to keep going because I'm not good enough. When really they just want you to keep going because you're feeling good, you know. So yeah. for the spouses, be patient, you know. And uh, for the for the warrior that's got the troubles, man, just open up, self-assess, yeah. and, and, and take action, man, like everything else in your life. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I love what you guys are doing. Um, I can't thank you enough for, for coming and sharing your story. Again, uh, All Secure and Arsenal of Hope are the books. Uh, allsecure.org is the uh, is the foundation. All Secure Foundation. All Secure org. Foundation.org. Uh, we do have some parting gifts. Um, that's for uh, from Champion Choice Silver and John Johnston and California, big supporters of the show, uh, have provided a, a a challenge coin with both logos on it uh, for the guests, cool. and then uh, in the boxes for. Uh, is for you to rock whenever you uh, oh, decide shit. to line dance or uh, <laughs> I need a bull now, yeah, man. Yeah. I was just talking about this today. Yeah. Uh, you, with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you go to, uh, if you go to the new roadhouse when it comes out, you can, uh, you can rock that in your That's shit. Cool as shit, man. Yeah. So I need some leather now. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, man, <laughs> Thanks, Tom, man. I, yeah, absolutely. My, my pleasure, our pleasure. Um, I can't thank you enough for coming, man. It's a fascinating interview. I honestly, I could talk to you for fucking two days straight. Um, you know, I, there's a million questions that, that pop up every time you answer one and, and whatever. Uh, I, I just, I can't thank you enough. I'm, I'm honored to, to be able to interview you. Um, and I'm super appreciative of you taking the time to, to come share your story with everybody. And absolutely. Uh, when you hit me up, I was like, yeah, any way to get what we're doing out there, yeah. you know, I'd love it. And yeah. you've got a big following and I really appreciate you having me on. I, I can't thank you enough. So, uh, I know you guys enjoyed it. I don't even have to tell you that, that I hope you did. It's one of the most uh, fascinating ones I've done for sure. Um, if you didn't like it, choke yourself. Uh, and, uh, but you know, on a serious note, I do appreciate everybody's uh, support and, and continuing to watch the show. Please uh, share it. And, uh, if you know somebody that's uh, struggling, a, a combat vet of any type, uh, special operations, combat vet of any type, uh, you know, please send them this interview and have them watch it and, and get them connected with Jen and Tom because, uh, they're doing phenomenal things for, for our combat vets. So thank you to, to both of you for coming and, and doing all that you do. Thanks to you, the listener, and until next time, this is Mike Drop.